Coming to you live from around the world to around the world, this is The Show Must Go Online, and I'm Robert Miles, actor, writer, director, and creator of the Shakespeare deck, which I promise should be restocked very soon. We have an incredible show for you tonight, and we're celebrating a milestone, 100,000 views since launch. Unbelievable. Thank you so much to everyone who's joined us on this incredible journey so far, whether you be audience, cast, or crew, all of your contributions are absolutely incredible and we are overwhelmed uh, to hit this milestone. Uh, if it's your first time seeing a show tonight uh, from the Show Must Go Online, please shout out in the live chat and our digital groundlings. I'm sure we'll be happy to welcome you into the fold. Uh, we'd love to reach 500,000 views by the end of this project. So if you're enjoying what you see, please spread the word and direct people to youtube.com forward slash Rob Miles to see more of our shows. Tonight's Love's Labour's Lost will, com uh, will commence in approximately 15 minutes time and tonight's show con contains adult themes and adult humor. Uh, the first half will run for approximately 90 minutes with a shorter than usual five minute interval followed by a 60 minute second half. On social please follow the show's official Twitter account TSMG Online Live or follow at the show must go online on Insta and Facebook. Share your reactions using the hashtag show must go online. Tonight's game is Spot the Dirty Jokes, and there's a lot of lusty language in Love's Labour's Lost, let me tell you. If you enjoy the show tonight, please like this video and subscribe to the channel, remembering, of course, to set the bell icon to receive all notifications. At this time, I'd like to introduce our cast and crew, starting as always, always even, with our laudable producer, Sarah Peachy. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm an actor and innovation project manager based in Glasgow. Our learned associate stage manager and master of props, Emily Ingram. Hi, I'm a writer, director and stage manager based in Edinburgh. Our lovely movement and fight coordinators, Yarit Dor and Enrique Ortuño. Hi, my name is Enrique. And I'm Yarit. And we are fight directors and movement directors based in London. And with special thanks to the very lovable Adam Woodhams for original sound this evening. Our lion-hearted casting director, Sydney Aldridge, has outdone herself once again this week with tonight's global cast, playing Barone, Ben Galpin. Hi, I'm Ben Galpin. I'm an actor based in London. The Princess of France, Charlotte Ellen. Hi, I'm Charlotte Ellen, and I'm an actor based in Stratford-upon-Avon. Ferdinand King of Navarre, Adam Parker. Hello, my name is Adam Parker, and I'm an actor and director from Southern California in the States. Boyette, Emily Carding. Hi, I'm Emily Carding, and I'm an actor and theatre maker based in Hastings, UK. Rosaline, Samia DeMeo. Hi, I'm Samia DeMeo, and I'm an actor based in London. Don Adriano de Armado, Stephen Leesk. Hello, my name is Stephen Leesk, and I'm an actor just outside of London. Costard, John Chapman. Hi, I'm John. Uh, I'm a semi-retired educationist and long-time amateur actor from just outside London. Moth, Alice Merivale. Hi, yeah, I'm Alice and I'm an actor from Liverpool. Domain, Alex Britt. Hi, I'm Alex Britt and I'm an actor usually based in London. Holophanes, Tahir Ashraf. Hi, I'm an actor, singer, presenter and a barrister and I'm based in Crawley, West Sussex near Gatwick Airport. Longerville, PJ Barner. Hi, I'm PJ Barner. I do um, non-profit work in the Philippines, and I'm also an actor here in Albany, New York. As Catherine, Tamara Ritala. Hi, I'm Tamara. I'm an actor and producer, usually based in London, currently isolating at my mum's in Germany. Sir Nathaniel, Garke Leung. Uh, hi, I'm Garke Leung. I'm not an actor. I'm a PhD student in politics at the University of Warwick, and I'm dedicating my performance tonight to my friend John Tennant. Maria, Maria Graciano. Hi, I'm Maria Graciano. I'm an actor from Amsterdam, and I'm based in London. As dull and ensemble, Christopher Padden. Hi, my name is Christopher Padden. I'm an actor, combatant, and stage manager based in Edinburgh. As Jacquinetta, Nadia Lamine. Hi, I'm Nadia Lamine, and I'm an actor in Oxfordshire. And our valiant swings for this evening, who, in the event of technical difficulties or personal emergencies, will swing into action to keep the story moving forward. First of all, Julia Stemper. Hello, I'm Julia Stemper, actor and theatre practitioner in Chicago, Illinois. And finally, Cameron Varner. Hello, I'm Cameron Varner, and I'm an actor out of Colorado and Chicago, Illinois. 
Wonderful. And now to introduce tonight's play, a friend of the show and one of our very first viewers, it's Andrea Smith. Andrea is a postgraduate researcher at the University of East Anglia and a member of the British Shakespeare Association. She's currently examining how Shakespeare plays have been presented on BBC Radio, delving deep into the corporation's archive of recordings. In a previous life, she was a journalist and radio producer, but her love of Shakespeare goes back to childhood when she first saw an excerpt of Romeo and Juliet in the film Carry On Teacher. Andrea, the play is Love's Labour's Lost and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rob. I've been a fan of this project, as you mentioned, since it all began, so I'm really delighted to be able to introduce one of my favourite plays. Love's Labour's Lost always seems to me, at least, to be a bit overlooked when it comes to Shakespeare's comedies. In fact, it's thought it wasn't performed at all for almost 200 years. Admittedly, it is rather thin on plot, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, and it is big on fun. The director, Harley Granville Barker, once asked, did Shakespeare ever do anything more delightful than Love's Labour's Lost? There's certainly a lot to enjoy, even if it hasn't been top of producers' to-do lists in recent years. As someone with an interest in Shakespeare on radio, as Rob just mentioned, I found that it, it's one of the least performed plays in that medium, hasn't been heard on air for more than 40 years. While on TV, the last British production was in 1985. Kenneth Branagh did make a film of it in the year 2000, but he cut three quarters of the text. So it still feels like the play is a little bit unloved. Hopefully tonight will help put that right. Nathan Lane, who appeared in Branagh's film, described Love's Labour's Lost as deeply silly. While Michelle Terry, who's appeared in it at both the RSC and Shakespeare's Globe, has said it has joie de vivre. It does have both those qualities, but personally, the thing I love most about it is the women. Many people would probably consider Shakespeare's greatest female character, certainly in a comedy, to be Rosalind in As You Like It. But she has a predecessor with a surprisingly similar name who could definitely give her a run for her money on wordplay and wit. Rosaline in Love's Labour's Lost is one of a quartet of strong women who are more than a match for the four men who fall hopelessly in love with them. The play begins with the King of Navarre and his three friends, Dumaine, Longerville and the reluctant Barone, vowing to give up all worldly pleasures to study for three years. This includes seeing women. Of course, what happens next? But they're promptly forced to abandon their pledges with the appearance of the Princess of France and her three friends, Catherine, Maria and Rosaline. It doesn't take much to work out where the plot might be going from here. What is interesting, though, is the portrayal of the two different sexes. The boys, and I will call them boys in this case because they do behave just like a bunch of nerdy teenagers, they go all to pieces at the first sign of female company. It's as if they've never seen a woman before. They all immediately fall head over heels in love. There's a wonderful scene in the play where each in turn agonises over the love poetry they're trying to write. It could be Adrian Mole or maybe Simon from The Inbetweeners. They've been described as fickle and silly, immature, even exhibitionist but they are earnest young men and they do believe that they're genuinely deeply in love, albeit with a bit of mischief thrown in along the way. The women, on the other hand, are the grown-ups. Critics have described them as intelligent and sensible, but that doesn't mean they're not susceptible to a bit of romance. In fact, before they meet the boys, they gossip about them, but they regard love and relationships in a much more mature way than their male counterparts. While the men write poetry and send the women gifts, the women take the mickey out of them and set them up for a fall. As the princess and Rosaline say, we are wise girls to mock our lovers so, they are worse fools to purchase mocking so. The women are intensely aware that the men might not be genuine in their affections, whether they realise it or not, and they aren't going to get caught out easily. In fact, the princess says later to the men that she and her friends have met your loves in their own fashion like a merriment, something the men protest against, declaring they were in earnest all along, however daft their behaviour might have been. H.R. Woodhausen, in his introduction to the Arden edition of this play, says, as always in Shakespearean comedy, the women are cleverer and wittier than the men. I knew there was a reason why I like Shakespeare. And the repartee between the main characters really shows this off. There's some wonderful banter between the lovers and the women always get the upper hand. Michelle Terry's described the women's language as their weapon, their armour, their power. Something echoed by the princess's attendant, Lord Boyette, who says in the play, the tongues of mocking wenches are as keen as is the razor's edge. There's obviously an element here of women having to use words when they have little other power, 
but the power they do have over these infatuated men they execute mercilessly. One of the ways they do this is by pointing out the fact the men seem unable to stick to their promises, which brings me on to the words forswear and forsworn. Now, although they sound very similar, they have subtly different meanings which are worth bearing in mind during the play. If someone forswears something, they're promising to give it up. So at the start of the play, the boys forswear seeing women. But to be forsworn is to break an oath or a promise. It's when you've sworn you'll do something and then you don't you do it. Barone is a, in a one, has a wonderful speech where he argues that the boys were right to give up their study for women. And he uses both words, telling his friends that they are all forsworn, that they've broken their promises, but that they were fools to forswear women in the first place. In other words, they should never have pleasure not to see them. Like a lot of early plays, Love's Labour's Lost celebrates language like this in an elaborate embroidery for its own sake, as Granville Barker put it. The play is mainly written in verse and more than a third of it is rhymed, making it the most heavily rhymed of all Shakespeare's plays. You'll probably have noticed how much of last week's Comedy of Errors features rhyming and there's more to come in Richard II and A Midsummer Night's Dream. And rhyming isn't the only thing Love's Labours has in common with the dream. Just like the adventures of the lovers in the wood near Athens, which ends with the mechanical's play, so Love's Labours Lost also finishes with a performance. In this case, a pageant masterminded by the schoolmaster Holofernes and curate Sir Nathaniel. They also use language to the extreme, but in their case, it's more about showing off their supposed erudition. Some of this language is quite dense and there's a liberal sprinkling of Latin too, but please don't be concerned about that. Michelle Terry has said that Shakespeare was writing censorially in this play, and it's a really good way to think of it. Don't worry about getting every word that these two say, just sort of feel it. It's a bit like nonsense poetry. It's the overall sense of it that matters, not the individual words. Now, Holofernes and Sir Nathaniel, Sir Nathaniel team up with our final main character, the magnificent Spaniard Don Armado, whose extraordinary use of English leads to one of the least double of double entendres. Uh, together, they mangle the language in the most marvellous ways. As Armado's page, Moth, says, they have been at the great, great feast of languages and stolen the scraps. Thankfully, as is often the way, the scraps are the best bit. Don Omardo is also one half of the fifth set of lovers in this play. Like the other boys, he falls hopelessly, childishly in love. In his case, not with a lady of the court, but with the country wench, Jacquinetta. However, she's also been receiving attentions from the yokel Costard. Shakespeare never makes clear which one she would rather be with. And unfortunately, unlike her courtly counterparts, Jacquinetta doesn't actually get to say a great deal. Like some of Shakespeare's more controversial women, such as Isabella in Measure for Measure, she doesn't get to tell us in the end who she chooses, although one of the men does speak for her. Now, while I'm talking about Love's Labour's Lost, I feel I must just mention the possibility that it did at one time have a sequel. A couple of contemporary sources tantalisingly mention Love's Labour's One. There's been lots of speculation about this and whether it might be an alternative title for one of the plays that we do still have. Various theories have been put forward, all's well that ends well, even Troilus and Cressida have been suggested, along with much ado about nothing, something the Royal Shakespeare Company put to the test a few years back when they used the same cast to stage both Love's Labours and Much Ado, which they retitled Love's Labours One. The nice thing about the show must go online is that as we work through Shakespeare's plays, you'll be able to see for yourself whether you think any of them is the most likely contender for Love's Labours One. Personally, I can definitely see some of the similarities between Barone in tonight's play and Benedict in Much Ado, but that might be about as much the fact that I love both plays as anything else. Woodhausen describes Love's Labour's Lost as one of Shakespeare's cleverest and funniest plays. He sums it up saying it's rooted in the Elizabethan period, but it's handling of the very themes of love and loss, of the relationships between men and women, of endings and of art still speaks to us. Certainly the theme of love is never going to go out of fashion, nor is the battle of the sexes. I do have one warning though, Love's Labour's Lost is a lovely romp, a proper romantic comedy, but as Barone says towards the end, our wooing doth not end like an old play, so be prepared for an unexpected twist. Thanks, Rob. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was a fantastic introduction. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, our show for tonight is about to begin. So please remember to capture your reactions on social using the hashtag show must go online and prepare for love, laughs and lasciviousness aplenty in tonight's Love's Labours Lost.
exit. Act one, scene one, the King of Navarre's Park. Enter Ferdinand, King of Navarre, Baron, Longaville, and Domain. Let fame that all hunt after in their lives live registered upon our brazen tombs, and then grace us in the disgrace of death. When, spite of cormorant devouring time, the endeavor of this present breath may buy that honor which shall bait his sight's keen edge and make us heirs of all eternity. Therefore, brave conquerors, for so you are, that war against your own affections and the huge army of the world's desire, our late edict shall stand in force. Navarre shall be the wonder of the world. Our court shall be a little academe, still and contemplative in living art. You three, Barone, Longueville, and Dumaine, have sworn for three years' term to live with me, my fellow scholars, and to keep those statutes that are recorded in this schedule here. Your oaths are passed, and now subscribe your names that his own hand may strike his honor down that violates the smallest branch herein. If you are armed to do so as sworn to do, subscribe to your deep oaths and keep it too. I'm resolved. Just by the three years past, what? The mind shall banquet. Though the body pine. My loving Lord Dumaine is mortified. To love, to wealth, to pomp, I pine and die with all these living in philosophy. I can but say their protestation over. So much the liege I have already sworn, uh, that is to live and study here three years. Uh, but there are other strict observances as not to see a woman in that term, which I hope well is not enrolled there and one day in a week to touch no food and but one meal on every day beside, the which I hope is not enrolled there. And then to sleep, but three hours in the night and not be seen to wink of all the day when I was wont to think no harm all night and make a dark night too of half the day, which I hope well is not enrolled there. Oh, these are barren tasks, too hard to keep. Not to see ladies, study fast, not sleep, your oath is passed to pass away from these. Let me say no, my liege, and if you please, I only swore to study with your grace and stay here in your court for three years' space. Swore to that, Baron, and to the rest. My yay and nay, sir, then I swore in jest. What is the end of study? Let me know. Why that to know, which else we should not know? Uh, things hid and barred, you mean, from common sense? Aye, that is study's godlike recompense. Oh, come on then, I, I will swear to study so, to know the thing I am forbid to know, as thus, uh, to study where I well may dine, when I to fast expressly am forbid, or study uh, where to meet some mistress fine, when mistresses from common sense are hid, or having sworn too hard a keeping oath, study to break it and not break my troth. If study's game be thus and this be so, study knows that which yet it doth not know. No, swear me to this and I will ne'er say no. These be the stops that hinder study quite and train our intellects to vain delight. Why, all delights are vain, but that most vain which with pain purchased doth inherit pain, as painfully to pour upon a book, to seek the light of truth, while truth the while doth falsely blind the eyesight of his look. Light, seeking light, doth light of light beguile. So, ere you find where light in darkness lies, your light grows dark by losing of your eyes. Study me how to please the eye indeed by fixing it upon a fairer eye, who dazzling so that eye shall be his heed and give him the light that was blinded by. A study is like the heaven's glorious sun that will not be deep searched with saucy looks. 
small have continual plodders ever won, save base authorities from others' books. <laughs> These earthly godfathers of heaven's light that give a name to every fixed star have no more profit of their shining nights than those that walk and what not what they are. <laughs> Too much to know is to know naught but fame. And every godfather can, can give a name. <laughs> oh, well, he's read to reason against reading. Proceeded well to stop all good proceeding. Reads the corn and still lets grow the weeding. The spring is near when green geese are a breeding. How fun is that? Fit in his place and time. In reason, nothing. Something then in rhyme? Barone is like an envious sneeping frost that bites the firstborn infants of spring. Why? Say I am. Why should proud summer boast before the birds have any cause to sing? Why should I joy in any abortive birth? At Christmas, I no more desire a rose than wish a snow in May's newfangled shows. But like of each thing that in season grows. So you, now to study it is too late. Climb over the house! Whoa! To unlock the little gate. Well, sit you up. Go home, Baron. Adieu. No. <clears throat> My good Lord, I have sworn to stay with you. And though I have for barbarism spoke more than for that angel knowledge, you can say, yet confident, I'll keep what I have sworn and bide the penance of each three years' day. Give me the paper. <sighs> Let me read the same. And to the strictest decrees, I'll write my name. How well this yielding rescues thee from thy shame. <laughs> Item, that no man shall come within a mile of my court. Hath this been proclaimed? Mm -hmm. Uh, four days ago. Let's see the penalty. On pain of losing her tongue. Who devised this penalty? Mary, that did I. <laughs> Sweet Lord. And, um, why? Well, to fright them hence with that dread penalty. A dangerous law against gentility. <laughs> Item. If any man be seen to walk with a woman within the term of three years, he shall endure such public shame as the rest of the court can possibly develop. This article, my liege, yourself must break. For well, you know, here comes in embassy, the French king's daughter with yourself to speak. A maid of grace and complete majesty oh, about surrender up of Aquitaine oh. to her decrepit, sick and bedrid father. Therefore, this article is mainly made in vain. Or vainly comes the admired princess hither. Uh, what say you, lords? Why, <laughs> this was quite forgot. So, study evermore is whoo, overshot. Uh, well, it doth study to have the thing it would, it doth forget to do the thing it should. And when it hath the thing it hunteth most, tis one as towns with fire. So one, so lost. We must of force dispense with this decree. She must lie here on necessity. <laughs> necessity will make us all forsworn 3,000 times within this three year space. For every man with his effects is born not by might mastered, but by special grace. If I break faith, this word shall speak for me. I'm forsworn on mere necessity. So, to the laws at large, I write my name. And he that breaks them in the least decree stands in attainder of eternal shame. Suggestions are to other as to me. But I believe, although I seem so loath, I am the last that will last keep his oath. <laughs> but is there no quick recreation granted? Aye, that there is. Our court, you know, is haunted with a refined traveler of Spain, a man in all the world's new fashion planted that hath a mint of phrases in his brain. 
one who the music of his own vain tongue doth ravish like a chanting harmony, a man of compliments, whom right and wrong have chose as the umpire of their mutiny. How you deny my lords, I know not, I, but I protest, I love to hear him lie, and I will use him for my minstrelsy. Armado is a most illustrious white. A man of new fire words! Fashion so <laughs> nice! <laughs> Oh, Custard, the swain, and he shall be our sport. So to study three years, that's but short. Which is the Duke's own person? Uh, this fellow, uh, what was? Uh, I myself reprehend his own person, for I am his grace's father, but I would see his own person in flesh and blood. Uh, this is he. Signor uh, Armour? Um, uh, commend you. There's a villainy abroad. This letter will tell you more. Sir, the contempts thereof are as touching me. Oh, a letter from the magnificent Armado. How low soever the matter, I hope in God for high words. Oh, a high hope for a low heaven. God, hmm? grant us patience. To hear or forbear hearing. Hmm? To hear meekly, sir, and to laugh moderately, or to forbear both. Well, sir, be it as the style shall give us cause to climb in the merriness. <laughs> the matter is to me, sir, as concerning Jack Winetta. The manner of it is, I was taken with the manner. In what manner? In a manner and form following, sir, all those three. I was seen with her in the manor house, uh, sitting with her upon the form, and taken following her into the park, which put together is in manner and form following. Now, sir, for the manner, it is the manner of a man to speak to a woman for the form in some form. <laughs> for the following, sir. <clears throat> as it shall follow in my correction. And God defend the right. Will you hear this letter with attention? As we would hear an oracle. <laughs> Such is the simplicity of man to hearken after the flesh. Great deputy, the Welkin's vicegerent and sole dominator of Navarre, my soul's earth's god and body's fostering patron. Oh, not a word of costard yet. So it is. Oh, it may be so. But if he say it is so, he is in telling true. But, um, so. Peace. Be to me and every man that dares not fight. No words. Of other men's secrets, I beseech you. So it is, besieged with sable-coloured melancholy, did I commend the black oppressing humour to the most wholesome physic of thy health-giving air. And as I am a gentleman, betook myself to walk. The time when, about the sixth hour, when beasts most graze, birds best peck, and men sit down to that nourishment which is called supper. <laughs> so much for the time when. Now for the Grand Witch, which I mean I walked upon. It is yclept thy park. Then for the place where, where I mean I did encounter that obscene and most preposterous event that draweth from my snow white pen the ebon coloured ink which here thou viewest, uh, beholdest, uh, surveyest, or ceased. But to the place where. It standeth north, northeast, and by east from the west corner of thy curious knotted garden. <laughs> there did I see that low spirited swain, that base minnow of thy mirth. Uh, me? That unlettered, small, knowing soul. Me? That shallow vessel. Still me? Which, as I remember, height custard. Oh, me! Sorted and consorted, contrary to thy established proclaimed edicts and continent canon, which with, ho oh, oh, with, but with this I passion to say, wherewith? Oh, 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 
with a wench. <laughs> the child of our grandmother Eve. A female, or oh, for thy more sweet understanding, a woman. Him, I, as my ever esteemed duty pricks me on, have sent to thee to receive the meed of punishment by thy sweet graces, officer, Anthony Dull, a man of good repute, carriage, bearing, and estimation. Me, and shall please you. I am Anthony Dull. For Jacanetta, so is the weaker vessel called, which I apprehended with the aforesaid swain. I keep her as a vessel of thy law's fury, and shall, at the least of thy sweet notice, bring her to trial. Thine in all the compliments of devoted and heart-burning heat of duty, Don Adriano de Armado. This is not so well as I look for, but the best that ever I heard. Oh, aye, the best for the worst. <clears throat> but Ciro, what say you to this? Sir, I confess the wench. Did you hear the proclamation? Well, I do confess much the hearing of it, but um, little of the making of it. It was proclaimed a year's imprisonment to be taken with a wench. Well, uh, I was taken with none, sir. Um, I was taken with a damsel. Well, it was pronounced, proclaimed damsel. Uh, this was no damsel, neither, sir. She was, uh, she was a, a virgin. <laughs> oh, it is so very too, for it was proclaimed virgin. Well, if I were, I, I deny a virginity. I was, um, I was, um, oh, I, I was taken with a maid. This maid will not serve your turn, sir. <laughs> this maid will serve my turn, sir. <laughs> sir, I will pronounce your sentence. You shall fast a week with bran and water. I'd rather pray a month with mutton and porridge. And Don Armado shall be your keeper. My lord Barone, see him delivered o'er, and go we lords to put in practice that which each to other hath so strongly sworn. I'll lay my head to any good man's hat. These oaths and laws will prove an idle scorn. Syrup, come on. I suffer for the truth, sir. But true it is, I was taken with Jacquinetta, and Jacquinetta is a true girl, and therefore welcome the sour cup of prosperity. <laughs> Affliction may one day smile again. <laughs> Until then, sit thee down, sorrow. Exeunt. Act 1, Scene 2, The King of Navarre's Park. Enter Armado and Moth, his page. Boy, what sign is it when a man of great spirit grows melancholy? A great sign, sir, that he will look sad. Why, sadness is one and the self-same thing, dear imp. No, no, oh Lord, sir, no. How canst thou part sadness and melancholy, my tender juvenile? Well, by a familiar demonstration of the working, my tough senor. Why tough senor? Why tough senor? Why tender juvenile? Why tender juvenile? I spoke it, tender juvenile, as a congruent epitaphon appertaining to thy young days, which we may nominate tender. And I, tough senor, as an impertinent title to your old time, which we may name tough. Pretty and apt. I mean you, sir. I pretty, and my saying apt. Or I apt, and my saying pretty. No, no, pretty because little. Little pretty, because little. Wherefore apt? And therefore apt, because quick. Speak you this in my praise, master. In thy condign praise. Ah, I will praise an eel with the same praise. What? That an eel is ingenious? That eel is quick. I do say thou art quick in answers. Thou heat'st my blood. I am answered, sir. I love not to be crossed. Oh, he speaks the mere country, crosses love not him. <sighs> I have promised to study three years with the Duke. Oh, you may do it in an hour, sir. Impossible. How many is one thrice told? 
I am ill at reckoning. It fitteth the spirit of a tapster. You are a gentleman and a gamester, sir. Uh, I confess both. They are both the varnish of a complete man. Then I'm sure you know how much the gross sum of juice ace amounts to. It doesn't amount to well more than two. Which the base vulgar do call three. True. Why, sir, is this such a piece of study? Now, here is three studied, here is three studied, and here you'll thrice wink. And how easy is it to put years to the word three and study three years in two words? A most fine finger! I'll to draw you a cipher. <laughs> I will hereupon confess. I am in love, and as it is base for a soldier to love, so am I in love with a base wench. If drawing my sword against the humour of affection would deliver me from the reprobate thought of it, I would take desire prisoner and ransom him to any French courtier for a new devised curtsy. <laughs> I think scorn to sigh, methinks I should outswear Cupid. Oh, comfort me, boy. What great men have been in love? Hercules, master. Most sweet Hercules. More authority, dear boy, name more and, and sweet, my child. Let them be men of good repute and carriage. Samson, master, he was a man of good carriage, for he carried the town gates on his back like a porter, and he was in love. Oh, well knit, Samson. Strong, jointed Samson. I do excel thee in my rapier as much as thou didst in carrying gates. <laughs> oh, I am in love too. Who was Samson's love, my dear Moth? A woman, master. Of what complexion? Of the seawater green, sir. Green, indeed, is the colour of lovers. But to have a love of that colour, methinks Samson had small reason for it. My love is most immaculate white and red. <laughs> most immaculate thoughts, master, are massed under such colours. So, if she be made of white and red, her faults will ne'er be known. For blushing cheeks by faults are bred, and fears by pale white shown. Then, if she fear, or be to blame, by this you shall not know, for still her cheeks possess the same, which native she doth owe. A dangerous rhyme, master, against the reason of white and red. Boy, boy, I do love that country girl that I took in the park with the rational hind Costa. She deserves well. Ah, oh, to be whipped, and yet better love than my master. <laughs> Sir. The Duke's pleasure is that you keep Costard safe, and you must suffer him to take no delight nor no penance, but a must fast three days a week. For this damsel, I must keep her at the park. She is allowed for the day, woman. Pay you well. I do betray myself with blushing, maid. Man. I will visit thee. At the lodge. Oh, that's hereby. I know where to situate. Oh, Lord, how wise you are. I will tell thee wonders. <laughs> With that face. I love thee. Mm, so I heard you say. And so. Farewell. <laughs> Fair weather after you. Come, Jaquenta, away. <laughs> Villain! Thou shalt fast for thy offences, ere thou be pardoned. Well, sir, I hope when I do it shall be on a full stomach. Thou shalt be heavily punished. Well, I am more bound to you than your fellows, for they are but lightly rewarded. Take away this villain, shut him up. Come, you transgressing slave, away. Oh, let me not be pent up, sir. I will fast, being loose. No, sir, that were fast and loose. Thou shalt to prison. Well, if ever I do see the merry days of desolation that I have seen, well, some shall see. <laughs> 
What shall some see? Nay, nothing, Master Moth, but what they look upon. It is not for prisoners to be too free in their words. And therefore, I will say nothing. <laughs> I thank God I have as much patience as another man. <laughs> and therefore, I can be quiet. <laughs> I do affect the ground. Which is base? Wear her shoe. Which is baser? Guided by her foot. Which is basest? Doth tread. I shall be forsworn, which is a great argument of falsehood, if I love. And how can that be true love, which is falsely attempted? Love is a familiar. Love is a devil. There is no evil angel but love. Yet was Samson so tempted, and he had an excellent strength. <laughs> Yet was Solomon so seduced, and he had a very good wit. Cupid's butt shaft is too hard for Hercules' club, and therefore too much odds for a Spaniard's rapier. The first and second cause will not serve my turn. The Bassano, he respects not. The Duello, he regards not. His disgrace is to be called boy, but his glory is to subdue men. Ha! Adieu, valor. Rust, rapier. Be still, drum. For your manager is in love. Yea, he loveth. Assist me, some extemporal god of rhyme. For I am sure that I will turn sonnet, devise wit, write pen, for I am whole volumes in folio. Exit. Act two, scene one. The King of Navarre's Park. Enter the Princess of France with three attending ladies, Rosaline, Maria, Catherine, and a lord named Boyette. Now, madam, summon up your dearest spirits. Consider who the king your father sends, to whom he sends, and what's his embassy. Yourself, held precious in the world's esteem, to parley with the sole inheritor of all perfections that a man may owe. Matchless Navarre, the plea of no less weight than Aquitaine, and dowry for a queen, be now as prodigal of all dear grace as nature was in making graces dear when she did starve the general world beside and prodigally gave them all to you. Good Lord, Boyette, my beauty, though but mean, needs not the painted flourish of your praise. Beauty is brought by the judgment of the eye, not uttered by base sale of Chapman's tongues. I am less proud to hear you tell my worth than you much willing to be counted wise in spending your wit in the praise of mine. But now to task the tasker. Good Boyette, you are not ignorant all telling fame doth noise abroad, Navarre hath made a vow. Till painful study shall outwear three years, no woman may approach his silent court. Therefore, to us seemeth in a needful course, before we enter his forbidden gates, to know his pleasure. And in that behalf, bold of your worthiness, we single you as our best moving fair solicitor. Tell him the daughter of the King of France on serious business craving quick dispatch, importunes personal conference with his grace. Haste signify so much while we attend like humble visaged suitors his high will proud of employment willingly i go all pride is willing pride and yours is so who are the votaries my loving lords that are vow fellows with this virtuous duke lord longerville is one know you the man I know him, madam. At a marriage feast between Lord Perigord and beauteous heir of Jacques Falconbridge, solemnized in Normandy, saw I this long avail, <laughs> a man of sovereign parts, peerless esteemed, well fitted in art, glorious in arms. Nothing becomes him ill that he would well. 
the only soil of his fair virtue's gloss, if virtue's gloss will stain with any soil, is a sharp wit matched with too blunt a will, whose edge hath power to cut, whose will stills will still wills it, should none spare that come within his power. Is some merry mocking lord belike? It's so? They say so most, that most his humours know. And such short-lived wits do wither as they grow. Who are the rest? The young domain, a well-accomplished youth of all that virtue, love for virtue, love, most power to do most harm, least knowing ill, for he hath wit to make an ill shape good, and shape to win grace, though he had no wit. I saw him at the Duke Allenson's once, and much too little of that good I saw is my report to his great worthiness. Another of the students at that time was there with him, if I have heard the truth. Theron, they call him, but a merrier man within the limit of becoming mirth, I never spent an hour's talk with all. His eye begs occasion for his wit, for every object that the one doth catch, the other turns into a mirth-moving jest, which his fair tongue, conceits expositor, delivers in such apt and gracious words that aged ears play truer at his tales, and younger hearings are quite ravished, so sweet and voluble is his discourse. God bless my ladies. Are they all in love that every one her own hath garnished with such bedecking ornaments of praise? Uh, here comes Boyette. Now what admittance, Lord? Navarre had notice of your fair approach, and he and his competitors in oath were all addressed to meet you, gentle lady, before I came. Mary, thus much I have learnt. He rather means to lodge you in the field, like one that comes here to besiege his court, than seek a dispensation for his oath to let you enter his unpeopled house. Oh, here comes Navarre. Fair princess, welcome to the court of Navarre. There I give you back again, and welcome I have not yet. The roof of this court is too high to be yours, and welcome to the wide fields too base to be mine. You shall be welcome, madam, to my court. Oh, I will be welcome then. Conduct me thither. <laughs> uh, hear me, dear lady, I have sworn an oath. Ah, oh, lady, help my lord, he'll be forsworn. Uh, not for all the world, fair madam, by my will. Why, Will shall break it. Will and nothing else. Uh, your ladyship is ignorant what it is. Were my lord so, his ignorance were wise, where now his knowledge must prove ignorance. I hear your grace hath sworn out housekeeping. Tis a deadly sin to keep that oath, my lord, and a sin to break it. <laughs> but pardon me, I am too sudden bold to teach a teacher ill beseemeth me vouchsafe to read the purpose of my coming, and suddenly resolve me in my suit. Madam, I will, if suddenly I may. You will the sooner that I were away, for you'll prove perjured if you make me stay. Did not I dance with you in Brabant once? Did not I dance with you in Brabant once? I know you did. How needless was it then to ask the question? You must not be so quick. Tis long of you that spur me with such questions. Your wit's too hot, it speeds too fast. Twill tire. Not till I leave the rider in the mire. What time a day? The hour that fools should ask. Mm. Now fare before your mask. Fair fall the face it covers. And send you many lovers. Amen, so you be none. Nay, then I will be gone. Madam, your father here doth intimate the payment of a hundred thousand crowns, being but the one half of an entire sum dispersed by my father in his wars. But say that he, or we, as neither have, received that sum, yet there remains unpaid a hundred thousand more, in surety of the which one part of Aquitaine is bound to us, although not to value to the money's worth. If then the king your father will restore but that one half which is unsatisfied, we will give up our right in Aquitaine and hold fair friendship with his majesty. But that, it seems, he little purposeth. 
For here, he doth demand to have repaid a hundred thousand crowns and not demand on payment of a hundred thousand crowns to have his title live in Aquitaine, which we much rather had depart with all and have the money which by our father lent than Aquitaine, so gelded as it is. Dear princess, were not his request so far from yielding's reason, your fair self should make a yielding, get some reason in my breast, and go well satisfied to France again. You do the king my father too much wrong, and wrong the reputation of your name in so unseeming to confess receipt of that which hath so faithfully been paid. I do protest, I never heard of it, and if you prove it, I'll repay it back or yield up Aquitaine. We arrest your word, but yet, you can produce acquittances for such a sum from special officers of Charles, his father. Satisfy me so. So please your grace, the packet is not come where that and other specialties are bound. Tomorrow you shall have a sight of them. It shall suffice me. At the witch interview, all liberal reason I will yield unto. Meantime, receive such welcome at my hand as honor, which uh, without breach of honor may make tender of to thy true worthiness. Uh, you may not come, uh, fair princess, within my gates, but here without you shall be so received as you shall deem yourself lodged in my heart. So, so denied fair harbor in my house. Your own good thoughts, uh, excuse me and farewell. Tomorrow, shall we visit you again? Sweet health and fair desires, consort your grace. Yeah, thy own wish wish I thee in every place. Lady, I will commend you to mine own hearts. Oh, pray you do my commendations. I would be glad to see it. I would you heard its groan. Wrong was the fool sick. Sick at the heart. Alack, cluttered blood. Oh, would that do it good? My physics say I. Will you prick it with your eye? No point with my knife. <laughs> now God save thy life. And yours from long living. I cannot stay thanksgiving. Sir, I pray you a word. What lady is that same? The heir of Alençon. Catherine is her name. My gallant lady, Monsieur, fare you well. I beseech you a word. What is she in the white? A woman sometimes, and you saw her in the light. Perchance light in the light, I desire her name. She hath but one for herself, to desire that were a shame. Pray you, sir, whose Daughter. Her mother's, I have heard. Sir. God's blessing on your beard. Good sir, be not offended. She is an heir of Falconbridge. Nay, my collar is ended. She is a most sweet lady. Not unlike, sir, that may be. What's her name in the cap? Uh, Rosaline, by good hap. Is she wedded or, or no? To her will, sir, or so. Uh, you, you are welcome, sir. Adieu. Farewell to me, sir, and welcome to you. At last is Baron, the merry madcap lord. Not a word with him, but a jest. And every jest but a word. Ah, it was well done of you to take him at his word. I was as willing to grapple as he was to board. Two hot sheeps, Mary. And wherefore not ships? No sheep, sweet lamb, unless we feed on your lips. You sheep and I pasture. Shall that finish the jest? So, you grant pasture for me. Not so, gentle beasts. My lips are no common, though several they may be. Belonging to whom? To my fortunes and me. Good wits be jangling, but gentles agree. This civil war of wits were much better used on Navarre and his bookmen, for here it is abused. If my observation, which very seldom lies, by the heart still rhetoric, disclose it with eyes, deceive me not now, 
Nava is infected. With what? With that which we love is entitled affected. Your reason? Why all his behaviours did make their retire to the court of his eye, peeping thorough desire. His face's own margent did quote such amazes that all eyes saw his eyes enchanted with gazes. I'll give you Aquitaine and all that is his, and you give him for my sake but one loving kiss. Come to our pavilion. Boyette is disposed. But to speak that in words which his eye hath disclosed. I only have made a mouth of his eye by adding a tongue, which I know will not lie. Oh, thou art an old love monger and speakest skillfully. Exeunt Omnes. Act three, scene one. The King of Navarre's Park. Ragatamano and his boy Mop. <laughs> Warble, child, make passionate my sense of hearing. Il s'appelle Mon Pony de Michel Magique. of years. Take this key, give enlargement to the swain. Bring him festinately hither. I must employ him in a letter to my love. Master, will you win your love with a French brawl? I mean, so, uh, brawling in French. No, oh, my complete master, but to, to jig off a tune at the tongue's end, to canary to it with your feet, humour it with turning up your eyelids. Right. Sigh a note. Huh. And sing a note. Uh -huh. Sometime through the throat. Uh -huh. as, as if you swallowed love with singing love. Sometime through the nose as if you, you snuffed up love by smelling love. <laughs> and with your hat. With your hat. Your hat. Penthouse-like over the, the shop of your eyes. With your arms crossed on your fat, thin... <clears throat> Thin belly doublet, like, like a rabbit on a spit. Or oh, your hands in your pocket, like a man after the old painting. And keep not too long on one tune, but a snippin' away. Oh. <laughs> These are compliments. These are humours. These betray nice wenches that would be betrayed without these and make them men of note. Do you note men that are most affected to these? How hast thou purchased this experience? Oh, by my penny of observation. But have you forgot your love? Almost I had. <laughs> A negligent student, learner by heart. By heart and in heart, boy. And out of heart, master. All these three, I will prove. What wilt thou prove? A man, if I live, and by this, by, in, and with, out upon the instant by heart you love her because your heart cannot come by her in heart you love her because your heart is in love with her and without heart you love her being out of heart that you cannot enjoy her i am all these three and three times as much more and yet nothing at all fetch hither the swain he must carry me a letter oh message well sympathized a horse to be an ambassador for an ass <laughs> what sayest thou? Marry, sir, you must send the ass upon the horse, for he is very slow gated. But I go. The way is but short, away. A swift as lead, sir. The meaning, pretty ingenious, is not lead a metal heavy, dull and slow? Is that lead slow, which is fired from a gun? Ha! Sweet smoke of rhetoric! Ha! He reputes me a cannon, and the bullet, that's he! Ha! I 
I shoot thee at the swain. Oh, then and I flee. <sighs> a most acute, juvenile, voluble, and free of grace. By thy favour, sweet Welkin, I must sigh in thy face. <sighs> most rude melancholy, valour gives thee pace. Oh, my herald is returned. Oh, a wonder, master. Here's a costard broken in a shin. But tell me, how was there a costard broken in a shin? I will tell you sensibly. No, thou hast no feeling of it, moth. I will speak that Lenvoy. I, running out that was safely within, fell over the threshold and broke my shin. We will Ooh. talk no more of this matter. Till there be more matter in the shin. <laughs> Sirrah, Costa, I will enfranchise thee and give thee thy liberty, set thee from durance, and in lieu thereof, impose on thee nothing but this. Bear this significant to the country maid, Jaconetta. Uh, there is remuneration for the best ward of mine honour, is rewarding my dependence. Moth follow. Like the sequel I, Signor Costard, at you. My sweet ounce of man's flesh. Now, will I look to his remuneration? <laughs> <Ooh>. Remuneration. <laughs> That's the Latin word for three farthings. <laughs> three farthings. Remuneration. <laughs> what is the uh, what is the price of this inkle? <laughs> One penny. No, I will give you a remuneration. Why well, carries it? Remuneration. Why it is fairer name than French crown. I will never buy and sell out of this word. <laughs> oh, uh, my good knave, Costard. Exceedingly well met. Oh, I pray you, sir, how much carnation ribbon may a man buy for a remuneration? Uh, what is remuneration? Marry, sir, eight me farthing. Why, then, three farthing work of silk. I thank you, worship. God be with you. Oh, uh, stay, I, I must employ thee, as thou wilt win my favour, good my knave. Do one thing for me that I shall entreat. Ooh, when would you have it done, sir? Oh, uh, this afternoon. <laughs> well, I'll do it, sir. Fare you well. Oh, no, 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 it's not what it is. Well, I shall know, sir, when I've done it. Why, villain, thou must know first. I will come to you first thing tomorrow morning. No, it, it, it must be done this afternoon. Tis this. The princess comes to hunt here in the park, and in her train there is a gentle lady. When tongues speak sweetly, they then name her name, and Rosaline they call her. Ask for her, and to her white hand, see, thou do commend this sealed-up counsel. There's thy guerdon. Go. Oh. <laughs> mm. Garden. Mm. Oh, sweet garden. Oh. It's better than remuneration. <laughs> Eleven pence farthing better. Most. Mm. Sweet garden. I will do it, sir, in print. Garden! Remuneration. <laughs> Oh, and I, forsooth, in love, I that have been love's whip, a very beadle to a humorous sigh, a critic, nay, a knight watch constable, a domineering pedant o'er oh, the boy, this senior junior giant dwarfed on Cupid, regents of love rhymes, lord of folded arms, the anointed sovereign of sighs and groans, and I, to be a Corporal of his field and wear his colours like a tumbler's hoop. What? I love. I sue. I seek a wife. A woman that is like a German clock. 
still repairing, ever out of frame, and never going aright. Uh, being a watch, but never being watched, that it may still go right. <laughs> Nay, to be perjured, which is worst of all. Oh, and among the three to love the worst of all. Whitely wanton, with a velvet brow, with two pitch balls stuck in her face for eyes. I am by heaven one that will do the deed, though Argus were a eunuch and a guard. And I decipher her, to watch for her, to pray for her. Go to, it is a plague that Cupid imposes for my neglect of his almighty dreadful little might. I will love right, sigh, pray, so grow. Oh, some men must love my lady, and some Joan. Exit, act four, scene one. The King of Navarre's Park. Enter the princess, a forester, her ladies, Rosaline, Maria, Catherine, and Lord Boyet. Was that the king that spurred his horse so hard against the steep uprising of the hill? No, not, but I think it was not he. Whoever was showed a mountain mind. Well, Lord, <laughs> today we shall have our dispatch. On Saturday we will return to France. Then, Forrester, my friend, where is the bush that we must stand and play the murderer in? Here, boy. Upon the edge of yonder coppice, a stand where you may make the fairest shoot. I thank my beauty. I am fair that shoot. And thereupon thou speakest, the fairest shoot? Pardon me, madam, for I meant not so. What? What? First praise me, and again say no. Oh, short-lived pride. Not fair, alack for woe. Oh, yes, madam, fair. Nay, never paint me now. Where fair is not, praise cannot mend the brow. Here, good my glass, take this for telling true. Fair payment for foul words is more than due. Uh, nothing but fair is that which you inherit. See, see, my beauty will be saved by merit. Oh, heresy and fair, fit for these days. A giving hand, though foul, shall have fair praise. But come, the bow. Now mercy goes to kill, and shooting well is then accounted ill. Thus I will save my credit in the shoot, not wounding. Pity would not let me do it. If wounding, then it was to show my skill that more for praise than purpose meant to kill. And out of question, so it is sometimes, glory grows guilty of detested crimes when for fame's sake, for praise, an outward part, we bend to that the working of the heart. As I, for praise alone, now seek to spill that poor dear's blood, that my heart means no ill. Not cursed wives hold that self sovereignty only for praise's sake when they strive to be lords or their lords. Only for praise, and praise we may afford. To any lady that subdues a lord. Oh, here comes a member of the Commonwealth. God dig then you all. Pray you, which is the head lady? Thou shalt know her fellow by the rest that have no heads. Oh, which is the greatest lady, the, the highest? The thickest and the tallest. The thickest and the tallest? It is so. Truth is truth, and your waist, mistress, were as slender as my wit. One of these maids' girdles for your waist should fit. Are you not the chief woman? You're the thickest here. What's your will, sir? What's your will? I, uh, I have a letter from Miss Monsieur Barone to one Lady Rosaline. Oh, thy letter, thy letter. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, stand aside, good bearer. Boyette. Can you carve? Break upon this capon. I am bound to serve. Oh, this letter is mistook. It importeth none here. It is writ to Jaconetta. Oh, we will read it, I swear. Break the neck of the wax, and everyone give ear. By heaven that thou art fair is 
is most infallible. True that thou art beauteous, truth itself that thou art lovely, more fairer than fair, beautiful than beauteous, truer than truth itself. Have commiseration on thy heroical vassal. The magnanimous and most illustrate King Cofetua set eye upon the pernicious and indubitant beggars and elephon, and he it was that might rightly say, Veni vidi vici, which to anathanize in the vulgar, oh, base and obscure vulgar, that illicit, he came, saw, and overcame. He came one, saw two, overcame three. Who came? The king. Why did he come? To see. Why did he see? To overcome. To whom came he? To the beggar. What saw he? The beggar. Who overcame he? The beggar. The conclusion is victory. On whose side? The king's. The captive is enriched on whose side? The beggars. The catastrophe is a nuptial. On whose side? The king's. No, on both in one or one in both. I am the king, for so stands the comparison, thou the beggar, for so witnesseth thy lowliness. Shall I command thy love? I may. Shall I enforce thy love? I could. Shall I entreat thy love? I will. What shalt thou exchange for rags, robes, for titles, titles, for thyself, me? Thus expecting thy reply, I profane my lips on thy foot, my eyes on thy picture, and my heart on thy every part. <laughs> Thine in the dearest design of industry, Don Adriano de Armado. Thus dost thou hear the Nemean lion roar against thee, thou lamb, that standest as his prey, submissive fall his princely feet before. But if thou strive, poor soul, what art thou then? Food for his rage, repasture for his den. What plume of feathers is he that has indicted this letter? What vein? What weathercock? Did you ever hear better? I am much deceived, but I remember the style. Else your memory is bad, going o'er it erewhile. This armado is a Spaniard that keeps here in court, a fantasy, a monarcho, and one that makes sport to the prince and his bookmates. Bell fellow, a word. Who gave thee this letter? I told you, my lord. And to whom should thou give it? From my lord to my lady. From which lord to which lady? From my lord Baron, the good master of mine, to a lady of France, he's called Rosaline. Thou hast mistaken his letter. Come, lords, away. Here, sweet, put this up. T'will be thine another day. Who is the shooter? Who is the shooter? Shall I teach you to know? Aye, my continent of beauty. Why, she that bears the bow. <laughs> oh, finally put off. My lady goes to kill horns, but if thou marry, hang me by the neck if horns that year miscarry. The finally put on. Well, then I am the shooter. And who is your dear? If we choose by the horns, yourself come not near. Eh. By my troth, most pleasant. I'll both defeat it. A mark marvellous well shot, for they both did hit it. A mark, oh, mark but that mark. A mark, says my lady. Let the mark have a prick in it to meet at, if it may be. Come, come, you talk greasily. You, your lips grow foul. She's too hard for you at pricks, sir. Challenger, to ball. <laughs> I fear too much robbing. Good night, <laughs> my good owl. Exeunt. Act four, scene two. The King of Navarre's Park. Enter Dull, Holophanes the Pedant, and Nathaniel from watching the hunt.
very reverent sport, truly, and done in the testimony of a good conscience. The deer was, as you know, sanguis in blood, ripe as the pommy water, now hangeth like a jewel in the ear of Calo, the sky, the welkin, the heaven, and anon falleth like a crab on the face of terror, the soil, the land, the earth. Truly, Master Holofenes, the epithetes are sweetly varied, like a scholar at the least, but, sir, I assure you, it was the buck of the first head. Sir Nathaniel, hold credo. Twas not an old credo, twas a pricket. Oh, thou monster ignorance, how deformed dost thou look? Sir, he hath never fed of the dainties that have bred in a book. He hath not eat paper, as it were. He hath not drunk ink. His intellect is not replenished. He is only an animal, only sensible in the duller parts. And such barren plants are set before us that we thankful should be, which we of taste and feeling are, for those parts that do fructify in us more than he. You two are bookmen. Can you tell me by your wit what's a month old cane's birth that's not five weeks old as yet? Dick Tinner, good man, Dahl. Dick Tinner, good man, Dahl. What is Dick Tinner? A title to Phoebe. Uh, a title to Luna. To the moon. The moon was a month old when Adam was no more, and wrought not to five weeks when he came to five score. The illusion holds in the exchange. It's true indeed. The collusion holds in the exchange. God comfort thy capacity. I say, the illusion holds in the exchange. And I say, the pollution holds in the exchange. But the moon is never but a month old, and I say besides that, twas a pricket that the princess killed. Uh, Sir Nathaniel, will you hear an extemporal epitaph on the death of the deer? And to humour the ignorant, call I the deer the princess killed a pricket. So shall it please you to abrogate scurrility. I will something affect the letter, for it argues facility. The prayful princess pierced and pricked a pretty pleasing pricket. Some say a saw, but not a saw till now made saw with shooting. The dogs did yell, put I to saw, then sorrel jumps from thicket, or pricket saw, or else a sorrel. The people fall a hooting. If Saw be saw, then L to saw makes it fifty saws, O oh sorrel, of one saw I a hundred make by adding but one more L. A rare talent! The talent, dear Claw, look how he claws him with a talent. Uh, this is a gift I have, a simple, simple, a foolish extravagant spirit, full of forms, figures, shapes, objects, ideas, apprehensions, motions, revolutions. These are begot in the ventricle of memory, nourished in the womb of peer martyr, and delivered upon the mellowing of occasion. But the gift is good in those in whom it is acute, and I... And thankful for it. Sir, I praise the Lord for you, and so may my parishioners, for their sons are well tutored by you, and their daughters profit greatly under you. You are a good member of the Commonwealth. Uh, if their sons be ingenious, they shall want no instruction. If their daughters be capable, I will put it to them. A soul feminine saluteth us. God give you good morrow, Master Person. Uh, be so good as read this letter. It was given me by Costard um, and sent me from Don Armado. I beseech you, read it. Bacile. If love make me forsworn, how shall I swear to love? Oh, never faith could hold if not to beauty vowed. Though to myself forsworn, to thee I'll faithful prove. Those thoughts to me were oaks, to thee like oziers bold. Study his bias leaves and makes his book thine eyes, where all those pleasures that live that art would comprehend. If knowledge be the mark, to know thee shall suffice. Well learned is that 
tongue that well can thee commend. All ignorant that soul that sees thee without wonder, which is to me some praise that I thy parts admire. Thy eye, Jove's lightning bears, thy voice is dreadful thunder, which, not to anger bends, is music and sweet fire. Celestial as thou art, oh, pardon love this wrong that sings heaven's praise with such an earthly tongue. You find not the apostrophus, and so miss the accent. Let me supervise the canzonet. Here are only numbers ratified but for the elegancy, facility and golden cadence of poesy. Carrot. Ovidius Naso was the man. And why indeed Naso, but for smelling the odiferous flowers of fancy, the jerks of invention. Imitari is nothing, so does the hound, his master, the ape, his keeper, the tired horse rider, but Damozella, virgin, was this directed to you? Well, I, sir, from one Monsieur Baron, one of the strange Queen's lords. I will all the glance the superscript. <clears throat> To the snow white hand of the most beauteous lady, Rosaline. I will look again on the intellect of the letter for the nomination of the party writing to the person written unto. <clears throat> Your ladyships in all desired employment. Barone. Sir Holofernes, this Barone is one of the votaries with the king, and here he hath framed a letter to a sequence of the Stranger Queens, which, accidentally, or by the way of progression, hath miscarried. Uh, trip and go, my sweets. Deliver this paper into the royal hand of the king. It may concern much. Say not thy like compliment. I forgive thy duty. Adieu. Good Costard, go with me. Sir, God save your life. Oh, I'm with thee, my girl. Sir, you have done this in the fear of God very religiously, and as a certain father saith. Uh, sir, tell me not of the father. I fear colourable colours. But to return the verses, did they please you, Sir Nathaniel? Marvellous well for the pen. I do dine today at the father's of a certain pupil of mine, where if before repast it shall please you to gratify the table with a grace, I will, on my privilege I have with the parents of the aforesaid child or pupil, undertake your bienvenuto, where I will prove those verses to be very unlearned, neither savouring of poetry, wit or invention. I beseech your society. And thank you too, for society, saith the text, is the happiness of life. And certes to the text most infallibly concludes it. Hmm. Sir, I do invite you too. You shall not say me nay. Away the gentles are at their game, and we will to our recreation. Exeunt. Act four, scene three. The King of Navarre's Park. Enter Barone with a paper in his hand. Alone. The king, he is hunting the deer. I am coursing myself. They have pitched a toil. I am toiling in pitch, pitch the defiles. Defile. A foul word. Oh, well, set thee down, sorrow, for so they say the fool said, and so say I, and I the fool. Ah, well proved wit. I will not love. If I do, hang me. In faith, I will not. Oh. But her eye, by this light, but for her eye, I will not love her. Yes, for her two eyes. Oh, I do nothing in the world but lie and lie in my throat, and by heaven I do love, and it have taught me to rhyme and to be melancholy. And here is part of the rhyme, and here my melancholy. Well, she hath one of my sonnets already. The clown bore it, the fool sent it, and the lady hath it. <laughs> Sweet clown, sweeter fool, sweetest lady. Oh, oh, by the world, I would not care a pin if the other three were in. 
comes on with a paper. Oh God, give him grace to grow. Uh. I me. Oh. Shut by heaven. Proceed, sweet Cupid. Thou hast something by the bird bolt under the left pap. In faith, the secrets. So sweet a kiss the golden sun gives not to those fresh morning dew drops upon the rose as thy eye beams when their fresh rays have smote the night of dew that on my cheeks down flows nor shines the silver moon one half so bright through the transparent bosom of the deep as doth thy face through tears of mine give light thou shinest in every tear that i do weep no drop but as a coach doth carry thee so rides thou triumphing in my woe do but behold the tears that swell in me and they thy glory through my grief will show but do not love thyself then that thou wilt keep my tears for glasses and still make me weep oh queen of queens how far dost thou excel no thought can think nor tongue of mortal tell oh, shall she know my grievances i will drop the letter sweet leaves shade folly wait who is it who comes here longerville what reading oh listen here now in thy likeness one more fool appear Forsooth, it is Longerville, I think. Ah, why? He comes in like a perjurer, wearing papers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but in love, I hope. Sweet fellowship and shame. One drunkard loves another of the name. <laughs> he speaketh oh. silently. <laughs> Perchance, if I move the tree nearer, I may over overhear. Mayhap love hath clipped his tongue. I fear these stubborn lines lack power to move. Oh, sweet Maria, impress on my love. These numbers will I tear and write in prose. <laughs> Rhymes are guards on wanton's cupid hose. This figure not is sharp. The same shall go. <sighs> Not the heavenly rhetoric of thine eye, against whom the world cannot hold argument, persuade my heart to feel this false perjury. Oh, vows to these broken deserve not punishment. Oh, woman, woman. I forswore, but I will prove thou being a goddess. I forswore not thee. My vow was earthly, but thou a heavenly love. Thy grace being gained cures all disgrace in me. Thou are what breath and breath of vapor is, and thou, fair sun, this on my earth dost shine. Exhalest this vapor vow. In thee it is, if broken then, it is no fault of mine. If by me broke, what fool is not so wise to lose an oath to win a paradise? This is the liver vein which makes flesh a deity, a green goose, goddess, pure, pure idolatry. God amend us, God amend us. We are much out of the way. By whom shall I send this? Company, stay. All hid, all hid, an old infant play like a demigod. Here sit I in the sky, and wretched fool secrets heedfully over I. <laughs> oh, more sacks to the mill. Oh, heavens, I have my wish to main transformed four woodcocks in a dish. Oh, most divine Kate. <laughs> oh, most profane coxcomb. 
By heaven, the wonder in a mortal eye. By earth, she is not corporal, there you lie. Her amber hairs from foul hath amber coated. An amber coloured raven was well noted. <laughs> oh, as upright as the cedar. Stoop, I say, her shoulder is with child. As fair as day. I uh, some days, but then no sun must shine. Oh, I got my wish. And I had mine. Uh, and mine too, good lord. Ah, oh, man, so I had mine is not that a good word. I would forget her, but a fever she reigned in my blood and will remembered be. A fever in your blood? Why, then incision would let her out in sauce, so sweet Miss Prison. <laughs> Once more, I'll read the ode that I had writ. Once more, I'll mark how love can vary wit. On a day, alack the day, love whose month is ever May spied a blossom passing fair, playing in the wanton air. Through the velvet leaves, the wind, all unseen, can passage find. The, the, the lover, sick to death, wished himself the heaven's breath. Air, quoth he, thy cheeks may blow. Ere would I might triumph so, but alack, my hand is sworn, ne'er to pluck thee from thy thorn. Thou alack for youth, unmeet youth, so apt to pluck as sweet. Do not call it sin in me that I am forsworn for thee. Thou, for whom Jove would swear Juno but a gorgon were, and deny himself for Joe, turning mortal for thy love. This I will send, and something else more plain that shall express my true love's fasting pain. Oh, that the king and Barone and Longaville were lovers too. Ill to example, ill would from my forehead wipe a perjured note, for none offend where all alike do dote. Do you mean? Thy love is far from charity, and that love's grief desires society. You may look pale, but I should blush. I know how to be o'erheard and take a napping so. Come, sir, you blush as your as such is your case. Come, sir. Oh, you chided him. Offending twice as much. You do not love Maria Longaville. Did never sonnet for her sake compile, nor lay his wreathed arms athwart his loving bosom to keep down his heart? Oh, I have been closely shrouded in this bush and marked you both, for you both did blush. I heard your guilty rhymes, observed your fashion, saw a size reek from you, noted well your passion. I, me, cries one, oh, Joe, the other. One, her hairs were gold, crystal, the other's eyes. You would for paradise break faith and troth, and Joe, for your love, would infringe an oath. What will Baron say? Hmm? When he shall hear faith infringed, which such zeal did swear, how will he scorn? How will he spend his wit? How will he triumph, leap, and laugh at it? For all the world that ever I did see, I would not have you know so much by me. Now step I forth to whip hypocrisy. Ah, good my liege, uh, I pray thee, uh, pardon me. <laughs> <clears throat> Good heart, what grace hast thou thus to reprove these worms for loving that art most in love? Oh, your eyes do make no coaches. In your tears there is no certain princess that appears. You'll not be purchased. Tis a hateful thing. Tush, none but minstrels like of sonneting. Nay, but are you not ashamed? Nay, are you not? All three of you to be thus much o'er shot. You found his moat, the king your moat did see, but I a beam do find in each of three. Uh. Oh, what a scene of foolery I have seen, of groans, of sighs, of sorrow, and of teen. Oh, me. With what strict patience have I sat? 
to see a king transform it to a gnat. Ugh. Where lies thy grief? Oh, tell me, good domain. And gentle Longerville, where lies thy pain? And where my leash is, all about the breast. A cordial! Oh! Too bitter is thy jest. Are we betrayed thus to thy overview? Not you by me, but I betray to you. I that am honest, I that hold it sin to break the vow that I am engaged in. I am betrayed by keeping company with men like you. Men of inconstancy. When shall you see me write a thing in rhyme? Lord bless the king. What present hast thou there? Oh, some certain treason. What makes treason here? Well, nay, it makes nothing, sir. Well, if it mar nothing, neither, then treason and you go in peace away together. I beseech your grace, uh, this letter, here, be read. Our person misdoubts it. <laughs> Twas treason, he said. Barone, read it over. Where hadst thou it? Of custard. Where hadst thou it? Uh, of uh, Don Adramadio. Don Adramadio. <laughs> oh, now, what is in you? Why dost thou tear it? Toy, my liege, a toy. Uh, uh, your grace needs not fear it. <laughs> it did move him to passion, therefore let's hear it. Uh, there is his name. And in Barone's writing. Oh, you false muggerheads, you were born to do me shame. Guilty? My lords, guilty, I confess, I confess. What? That you three fools lacked me fool to make up the mess. He, he, and you, and, and you, yes, my liege, and I are pick purses in love and we deserve to die. Oh, dismiss this audience and I shall tell you more. <laughs> now the number is even. True, true, we are four. Now will these turtles be gone? A hamster is away. Yeah. Walk aside, the true folk, and let the traitors stay. Sweet lovers. Oh, let us embrace. Oh. Mm. Uh. As true we are as flesh and blood can be, the sea will ebb and flow. Heaven show his face. Young blood doth not obey an old decree. We cannot cross, cross the cause why we were born. Therefore, of all hands must we be forsworn. What? Did, did those rent lines show some love of them? Did they? Quoth you. Who sees the heavenly Rosaline that like a rude and savage man of Indy at the first opening of the gorgeous east bows not his vassal head and struck and blind kisses the base ground with obedient breast. What peremptory eagle-sighted eye dares not look upon the heaven of her brow that is not blinded by her majesty. What zeal, what fury hath inspired thee now? My love, her mistress is a gracious moon. She, an attending star, scarce seen a light. My eyes are then no eyes. No, I burn. Oh, well, but for my love, day would turn to night of all complexions that cold sovereignty do meet as fair in her fair cheek. Where several worthies make one dignity, where nothing wants that once itself doth speak. Oh, let me the flourish of all gentle tongues. What fight painted rhetoric? Oh, she needs it not. To think of sail as sellers praise belongs. She passes praise. Well, then praise too short doth blot. A withered hermit, five score winters worn might shake off fifty looking in her eye. Beauty doth varnish age as if newborn, and gives the crutch the cradle's infancy. Oh, tis the sun that maketh all things shine. Mm, by heaven, thy love is black as ebony. Is ebony like her? Oh, wood divine, a wife of such wood were felicity. Oh, who can give me an oath? Where is the book? 
that I may swear beauty doth beauty lack if she not learn of her eye to look. No, no face is fair that is not full so black. <laughs> but what of this? Are we not all in love? Oh, uh, nothing so sure. <laughs> Thereby all forsworn. Then leave this chat and good Baron. Now prove our loving lawful and faith not torn. I marry there some flattery for this evil. Some authority how to proceed, like some tricks, some quillets. How to cheat the devil? Some salve for perjury. Oh, it is more than needs. How about you then? Affections, men at arms. Consider what you first did swear unto. To fast, to study, and to see no woman? A flat treason against the kingly state of youth. Oh, we have made a vow to study, lords, and in that vow, we have forsworn our books. For when would you, my liege, or you, or you, in leaden contemplation, have found out such fiery numbers as the prompting eyes of beauty's tutors have enriched you with? Other slow arts entirely keep the brain, and therefore, finding barren practices scarce show a harvest of their heavy toil. But love, first learned in a lady's eyes, lives not alone, immured in the brain, but with the motion of all elements. Course is as swift as though in every power and gives to every power a double function, above their functions and their offices. It adds a precious scene to the eye. A lover's eyes will gaze an eagle blind. A lover's ear will hear the lowest sound. Love's feeling is more soft and sensible than are the tender horns of cockled snails. <laughs> Love's tongue proves dainty Bacchus grossed in taste. For valor is not love a Hercules still climbing trees in the Hesperides. Subtle as Sphinx, as sweet and musical as Apollo's bright lute strung with his hair. And when love speaks, the voice of all the gods makes heaven drowsy with the harmony. Never durst poets touch a pen to write until his ink were tempered with love's sighs. Ah. Oh. Then his lines would ravish savages and plant in tyrants mild humility. From women's eyes, this doctrine I derive, they sparkle still the right Promethean fire. They are the arts, the books, the academes that show, contain and nourish all the world. Then fools you were, these women to forswear, or keeping what is sworn, you will prove fools. For wisdom's sake, a word that all men love, or for love's sake, a word that loves all men, or for women's sake, by whom we men are men, let us once lose our oaths to find ourselves. Yes! Cupid then, and soldiers, to the field. Advance your standards and upon them, Lords Pell-Mell, down with them. But first be advised that in conflict you get the son of them. <laughs> Wait, now to plain dealing, lay these gloses by. Shall we resolve to woo these girls of France? Aye, and win them too. Therefore, let us devise, devise some entertainment for them in their tents. From the park, let us conduct them hither. Then every man attach the hand of his fair mistress. In the afternoon, we will with some uh, strange pastimes, such as the shortness of time can shape for uh, revels, uh, dances, masks, merry hours, for run fair love, strewing her way with flowers. <laughs> away, away! No time shall be omitted. That will be time, and may by us be fitted. Exeus.
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the interval. You now have just five minutes to refresh yourselves, refresh your drinks, pop to the loo, do whatever you need to do. Uh, we will be starting again promptly at 2050 BST. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show so far. If you did, please like the video, subscribe to this channel, and make sure to set the reminders uh, in order to receive notifications for our future shows. Similarly, please consider donating to our Patreon as well, if you would mind awfully uh, we are uh, we have over 100 patrons now which is absolutely fantastic and phenomenal and we thank each and every one of you and sarah i believe we might have some new patrons to thank this week we do indeed so yes uh, thank you so much again to as rob said all of our existing patrons and thank you to our new uh, sign ups that we've had this week so um, a shout out to gareth Eva G, Louisa M, Jen S, Chloe B, RJ M, Alex B, uh, Woodland Maples, Danielle F, Susan R, um, and CLC. <laughs> so thank you, thank you so much for all your very kind donations. It means so much to everyone involved in the project. Um, uh, yes, and, and as Rob said, the link is in the YouTube description. We've also now this week got a couple of secret behind the scenes posts especially for our patrons that you can access once you've signed up absolutely we've been working hard on those as has emily ingram our master of props who is sharing some of her theatrical magic with our patrons over on patreon so uh, remember that you can give as little as one pound and five pence a month uh, so please don't feel like uh, it might be out of your price range but equally obviously if you have been affected by covid we all understand how that feels all too well so neither should you feel pressured i've got a few questions here from our wonderful audience uh, someone said i want to hear where the idea came from for the dubbing. Uh, the idea actually struck me uh, when we decided to get a Disney Plus uh, subscription shortly before the uh, show started and we decided to watch Ant-Man uh, and some brilliant scenes of Luis uh, recounting his tales uh, to uh, the other characters and you see them kind of talking in his voice and I thought that might be a wonderful way for us to bring those letters to life and again just do something new and different with the format of the show uh, using the tools that Zoom allows us to use so that is where that one came from uh, someone has asked what was most surprising in rehearsals uh, obviously we can ask this of our cast at the end as well uh, but for me personally I have to say it was just the absolute commitment and energy and creativity of our cast for this week they have hit the ground at an absolute gallop and have continued relentlessly for two and a half days to uh, engineer as many creative ideas as they can and throw them into the play and take uh, the ideas that myself and Emily and Yarrett and Enrique have all uh, kind of given them and then grow those out and make them their own. So they've really done a phenomenal job. So I'd say I've been most surprised by the sheer amount of creativity that's been thrown at this play, which is, I will admit, one of my absolute favourites. I love this play, so I hope if you're watching now, you love it too. And this uh, version might have given you a reason to uh, re-examine what is certainly one of the wordiest uh, of Shakespeare's plays. Absolutely. Um, We've also got another one here. Um, how did you come up with a wooden spoon foliage? I think that was because Ben didn't have plants in his house. Uh, I think it was as simple as that. Uh, and so obviously the ingenuity uh, takes over and we get wonderful ideas like that that are probably better than just having a literal plant. Uh, I certainly really enjoyed it. Uh, someone's asked, uh, I would love to know how the duckling came into the show. Well, uh, stick around until the end of the show to find out. I want Charlotte to tell you that story because it's a wonderful one. Um, We've also got uh, a bit of a puzzle, I understand, Ed has put on the chat, uh, the live chat, about what part did I play? Yes, indeed. I did play a role in a production of this, uh, probably going on 10 years ago now, uh, and indeed I did play Barone. And I did notice in the chat that someone mentioned that uh, that's why I must have cast the actor that looks most like me in that role. I can assure you that that was entirely Sydney's decision, and 
I had no part to play in that. However, Ben is doing an absolutely incredible job of it and making the role his own. And I, I'm absolutely loving what he's doing. So this is your one minute bell, your one minute bell, ladies and gentlemen. So please uh, take your seats and get ready for the second half. We'll be starting very, very shortly. Actors, if you're there in the tiring house, please prepare uh, to make your first entrances. Uh, we've got a couple more questions here, but they're all for the cast. So I want to keep those for our post show discussion as well. So if you haven't done it already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel uh, and consider as well tuning in on Monday over on the Quirk Books YouTube channel for much ado about Mean Girls, a wonderful treatment of uh, one of my favourite movies, Mean Girls, and I mean that very seriously, uh, in Elizabethan language by Ian Desher. It's a really cracking piece of work. So please consider joining us for that. There is a link where you can get a ticket from Eventbrite in the YouTube description. And finally, please share your reactions to the show so far using the hashtag show must go online. And with that, we are ready to commence with the second half of the play. So please make yourselves comfortable, sit back, relax and enjoy the remainder of a love's labours lost. Act 5, Scene 1. The King of Navarre's Park. Enter the pedant Holophanes, the curate, Sir Nathaniel, and Dull. I praise God for you, sir. Your reasons at dinner have been sharp and sententious, pleasant without scurrility, witty without affection, audacious without impudency, learned without opinion, and strange without heresy. I did, I did converse this quondam day with a companion of the king's who was entitled, nominated, or called Don Adriano de Amado. His humour is lofty, his discourse peremptory, uh, his tongue filed, his eye ambitious, his gait majestical, and his general behaviour vain, ridiculous, and thrasonical. He is too picked, uh, too spruce, too affected, too odd, as it were, uh, too peregrinate, as I may call it. A most singular and choice epithet. Cheera! Quare cheera, not sirra. Men of peace well encountered. Most military, sir, salutation. He a great feast of languages and stolen the scraps. <laughs> oh, they have lived long on the arms basket of words. I marvel thy master have not eaten thee for a word. For thou art not so long by the head as honorificabili tudinitatibus. Thou art easily a swallow than a flat dragon. Peace, the, the peel begins. Monsieur. Are you not let read? Yes! Yeah, he teaches boys by the horn book. <clears throat> what is A B spelled backward with the horn on its head? Bar Parisia with a horn added. Bar, most silly sheep with a horn. You hear his learning. Qui, qui thou consonant. Ooh, the last of the five vowels. If you repeat them, <laughs> or the fifth, if I. A, mm. E. I will I. repeat them, A, E, I. The sheep, the other two conclude this. <laughs> <O>, oh, you. <laughs> now by the salt wave of the Mediterranean, a sweet touch, a quick virtue of wit. Snip, snap, quick and home. It rejoiced in my intellect. <laughs> True wit. <laughs> Oh, and I have but a penny in the world. Thou shouldst have it to buy gingerbread. Hold. There is the very remuneration I had of thy master. Thou hit me purse of wit, thou pigeon egg of discretion. <laughs> Artman, preambulate. We will be singled from the barbarous. Do you not educate youth at the charge house on the top of the mountain? I do, sans question. Sir, it is the king's most sweet pleasure and affection to congratulate the princess at her pavilion in the posteriors of this day, which the rude multitude call the afternoon. 
the posterior of the day. Most generous, sir, is liable, congruent, and measurable for the afternoon. The word is well culled, chose, sweet, and apt, and I do assure you, sir, I do assure you. Sir, the king is a noble gentleman and my mm. familiar, I do assure you. Very good friend. For what is inward between us, let it pass. I do beseech thee, remember thy courtesy, I, I beseech thee, apparel thy head. And among other importunate and most serious designs, and of great import indeed too, but let that pass. For I must tell thee, it will please his grace by the world sometime to lean upon my shoulder and with his royal finger thus dally with my excrement. <laughs> dally with, 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 with my mustachio. Ha, 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 ha. But sweetheart, let that pass. <laughs> by the world, I recount no fable, some certain special honours it pleaseth his greatness to impart to Armado, a soldier, a man of travel that hath seen the world, but let that pass! <laughs> the very all of all is. Uh, but, sweetheart, I do implore secrecy that the king would have me present the princess, sweet Chuck, with some delightful ostentation or show or pageant or antic or firework! <laughs> Now, understanding that the curate and your sweet self are good at such eruptions and sudden breaking out of mirth, as it were, <laughs> I have acquainted you with all to the end to crave your assistance. Uh, sir, you shall present before her the nine worthies. Uh, Sir Nathaniel, as concerning some entertainment of time, some show of the posterior of this day, to be rendered by our assistants, the king's command and this most gallant, illustrate and learned gentleman before the princess, I say, none so fit as to present the nine worthies. Where will you find men worthy enough to present them? Joshua, yourself, myself, Judas, Maccabeus, and this gallant gentleman, Hector. Uh, this swain, because of his great limb or joint, shall pass Pompey the Great, the page, Hercules. <laughs> Pardon, pardon, sir, error. He is not quantity enough for that worthy's thumb. He is not so big as the end of his club. Uh, shall I have audience? He shall present Hercules in minority. His enter and exit shall be strangling a snake, and I will have an apology for that purpose. Oh, an excellent device. So, if any of the audience hiss, you may cry, Well done, Hercules, now thou crushes the snake. That is the way to make an offence. Gracious, though few have the grace to do it. Uh, for the rest of the worthies? I will play the... My, I will play three myself. Oh, thrice worthy gentleman. Oh, shall I tell you a thing? We attend. We will have, if this fadge not, an antic. Oh, I beseech you follow. Vera Goodman <laughs> Dull, thou hast spoken no word all this while. Nor understood none neither, sir. Alons, we will employ thee. Ooh, I'll make one in a dance. Or oh, oh, so, or I will play on the table. <laughs> to the worthies, and let them dance the hair. Most dull, honest dull. To our sport. Away! Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 2. The King of Navarre's Park. Enter the ladies. The Princess, Maria, Catherine and Rosaline. Perhaps we shall be rich ere we depart. If fairings come thus plentifully in, a lady walled about with diamonds. Look you what I have from the loving king. Madam, came nothing else along with that. Nothing but this. Yes, as much love in rhyme as would be crammed up on a sheet of paper. Writ at both sides of the leaf, 
margins and all, that he was fain to seal on Cupid's name. But Rosaline, you have a favour too. Who sent it? What is it? I would you knew, and if my face were but as fair as yours, my favour were as great. <gasps> Be witness this. <gasps> Nay, I have favours too. <laughs> I thank Brown. The number's true, as were the numbering too. I were the fairest goddess on the ground. I am compared to 20,000 fairs. Oh, he has drawn my picture. In his oh, anything to like? Oh, well, much in the letters, nothing in the praise. Oh, beauteous as ink. A good conclusion. But Catherine, what was sent to you from fair domain? Madam, this glove. Did he not send you twain? Uh, yes, madam. And moreover, some thousand verses of a faithful lover, a huge translation of hypocrisy, vilely compiled, profound simplicity. Yes, and these pearls to me sent Longueville. <laughs> this letter is too long by half a mile. <laughs> I think no less. Dost thou not wish in heart the chain were longer and the letter short? Aye, or I would these hands might never part. We are wise girls to mock our lovers so. They are worse fools to purchase mocking so. <laughs> that same baron I'll torture, ere I go. Oh, that I knew he were but in by the week. How I would make him fun and beg, and seek, and wait the season, and observe the times, and spend his prodigal wits into bootless rhymes, and make him proud to make me proud, but just so pretend, like I would o'er sway his state, that he should be my fool, and I his fate. None are so surely caught, as when they are catched, as wit turn fool. Folly, in wisdom hatched, hath wisdom's warrant, and the help of school and wit's own grace, to grace a learned fool. The blood of youth burns not with such excess as gravity's revolt to wantonness. Folly in fools bears not so strong a note as foolery in the wise when we doth tote. Since all the power thereof it doth apply to prove by wit worth and simplicity. Oh, here comes Boyette, oh. and Nerf is in his face. Oh, I am stabbed with laughter. Where's her grace? Uh, thy news, Boyette. Prepare, madam, prepare. Arm, wenches, arm. Encounters mounted are against your peace. Love doth approach disguised. Armed in arguments. You'll be surprised. Muster your wits. Stand in your own defence. Or hide your heads like cowards and flyers. Oh, St. Dennis to St. Cupid, what are they that charge their breath against us? Say, Scout, say! Under the cool shade of a sycamore, I thought to close mine eyes some half an hour, when, lo, to interrupt my purposed rest, toward that shade I might behold addressed the king and his companions. Well, I stole into a neighbor thicket by and overheard what you shall overhear, that by and by disguised, they will be here. The herald is a pretty knavish page that well by heart hath conned his embassage. Action and accent did they teach him there. Thus must thou speak and thus thy body bear. And ever and anon they made a doubt, presence and majestical would put him out. For, quoth the king, an angel shalt thou see, yet fear not thou, but speak audaciously. And the boy replied, an angel is not evil. I should have feared it had she been a devil. With that, all laughed and clapped him on the shoulder, making the bold wag by their praises bolder. One rubbed his elbow thus and fleered and swore a better speech was never spoke before. Another with his finger and his thumb cried, 
fear. We will do it. Come what will come. At that, he capered and cried, all goes well. The fourth turned on the tail and down he fell. With that, they all did tumble on the ground with such a zealous laughter, so profound that in this spleen ridiculous appears to check their folly, passions solemn too. But what? But what? Come they to visit us? They do, they do, and are apparelled thus. Like Muscovites. Oh, Russians, as I guess, their purpose is to parley, to court and dance, and everyone his love beat will advance unto his several mistress, which they are now by favours several which they did bestow. Will they so? The gallants shall be tasked. For ladies, we will every one be masked, and not a man of them shall have the grace, despite of suit, to see a lady's face. Hold, Rosaline, this favour thou shalt wear, and then the king will court thee for his dear. Hold, take thou this, my sweet, and give me thine, and so shall Barone take me for Rosaline. And change your favours too, so shall your loves woo contrary, deceived by these removes. Come on then, where are the favours most in sight? But in this changing, what is your intent? The effect of my intent is to cross theirs. They do it but in mockery merriment, and mock for mock is only my intent. Their several counsels they embosom shall to love's mistook, and so be mocked with all upon the next occasion that we meet with visages displayed to talk and greet. But um, shall we dance if they desire us to it? No, to the death we will not move a foot, nor to their pen speech render we no grace, but while tis spoke each turn away her face. Why, that content will kill the speaker's heart and quite divorce his memory from his part. Therefore I do it and make no doubt the rest will ne'er come in if he be out. There's no such sport as sport by sport or throne to make theirs ours and ours none but our own. So shall we stay mocking intended game and they well mocked depart away with shame. The trumpet sounds, be masked, the maskers come. Uh, all hail the richest beauties on the air. Beauties no richer than rich taffeta. Uh, uh, a holy parcel of the fairest dames that ever turned their uh, backs to mortal views. Their eyes, fill in their eyes. And ever turned their eyes to mortal views. Out, um, out. True, out indeed. Out of your favours, heavenly spirits, vouchsafe not to behold once to behold, rope. Once to behold with your sunbeamed eyes. With your sunbeamed eyes. As I will not answer to that epithet. You were best to call it daughter beamed eyes. Do not mark me, and that brings me out. Is this your perfectness? Be gone, you rogue. <clears throat> what would these strangers know their minds, but yet? If they do speak our language, tis our will that some plain man recount their purposes, know what they would. What would you with a princess? Nothing but peace and gentle visitation. What would they, say they? Nothing but peace and gentle visitation. Why, that they have, and bid them so be gone. If she says you have it, and you may be gone. And say to her, we have measured many miles to tread a measure with her on this grass. 
they say that they have measured many a mile to tread a measure with you on this grass. It is not so. Ask them how many inches is in one mile. If they have measured many, the measure of one is easily told. If to come hither you have measured miles and many miles, the princess bids you tell how many inches doth fill up one mile. Tell her we measure them by weary steps. She hears herself. How many weary steps of many weary miles you have overgone are numbered in the travel of one mile? We number nothing that we spend for you. Our duty is so rich, so infinite, that we may do it still without account. account. Vouchsafe to show the sunshine of your face that like savages we may worship you. My voice is but a moon and clouded too. Blessed are clouds to do as such clouds do, vouchsafe bright moon, and these thy stars to shine, those clouds removed upon our watery eyes. Oh, vain petitioner, beg a greater matter, thou now requests but moonshine in the water. Then, in our measure too, but vouchsafe one change, thou bidst me beg? Huh? This begging is not strange. Play music then. Nay, you must do it soon. Not yet, no dance, thus change I like the moon. Ach, will you not dance? How come you thus estranged? You took the moon at full, but now she's changed. Yet still, she is the moon, and I the man. The music plays, vouchsafe some motion to it. Our ears vouchsafe it. Well, but your legs should do it. Uh, since you are strangers and come here by chance, will not be nice. I'll take hands. <laughs> Be not nice. We can afford no more at such a price. Uh, well, price you yourselves then. What uh, what buys your company? Your absence only. Well, that can never be. Then we cannot be bought. And so adieu twice to your visor and half once to you. If uh, if you deny the dance, let's let's hold more chat. In private, then. Oh, I am best pleased with that. <sighs> White-handed mistress, uh, one sweet word with thee. <laughs> Honey and milk and sugar, there is three. One word in secret. Let it not be sweet. Uh, thou grievest my gall. Gall, bitter. Therefore. Meat? <laughs> Will you vouchsafe with me a vard? Name it. Fair lady. Say you so? Fair lord. Take that for your fair lady. Please with you as much in private than I bid adieu. What? Was your visor made without a tongue? I know the reason, lady. Why you ask? Oh, for your reason, quickly, sir. I long. Well, you have a double tongue within your mask and could afford my speechless wizard half. Veal, quoth the Dutchman. Is not veal a calf? A uh, calf, fair lady? No, a fair lord calf. Uh, let's part the word. Oh, <laughs> not be your half. Take all and wean it. It may prove an ox. Oh, oh, oh how you butt yourself with these shot marks. Will you give? Horns, chaste lady, do not so. 
<laughs> then die a calf before your horns do grow. One word in private with you, ere I die. Bleat softly, then the butcher hears you cry. <laughs> the tongues of mocking wenches are as keen as is the razor's edge invisible, cutting a smaller hair than may be seen above the sense of sense. So sensible seemeth their conference, their conceits have wings, fleeter than arrows, bullets, wind, thoughts, swifter things. Not one word more, my mates. Break off, break off. By, by heaven, or dry beaten with. Pure scoff! Oh, well, mad wenches, you have simple wits! Ah! Twenty a Jews, my frozen Muscovite! Ah, are these the breed of wits so wondered at? Tapers they are, with your sweet breaths puffed out. Well, liking wit they have, gross, gross, fat, fat. Oh, poverty in wit, kingly, poor, flout. Will they not, think you, hang themselves tonight, or ever but in visage show their faces? This pert barone was out of countenance quite. They were all in lamentable cases. The king was weeping ripe for a good word. A barone did swear himself out of all suit. The maid was at my service and his sword. No point, quoth I, my servant straight was mute. Lord Longerville said I came o'er uh, his heart and throw you what he called me. Farm, perhaps. Yes, in good faith. A go sickness as thou art. <laughs> well, better whips of one plain statued cap. But will you hear? The king is my love sworn. And quick Barone hath plighted faith to me. And Longerville was for my service aboard. Domain is mine as sure as bark on tree. Madam and pretty mistresses give ear. Immediately they will again be here in their own shapes. For it can never be they will digest this harsh indignity. Will they return? They will, they will, God knows, and leap for joy. They, they are lame with blows, therefore change favours. And when they repair, blow like sweet roses in the summer air. How blow? How blow? Speak to be understood. Fair ladies masked our roses in their bud. Dismasked, their damask sweet commixture shown, are angels veiling clouds or roses blown. Avaunt perplexity. What shall we do if they return in their own shapes to woo? Good madam, if by me you'll be so advised, let's mock them still as well known as disguised. Let us complain to them what fools were here, disguised as Moscovites and shapeless gear, and wonder what they were and to what end their shallow shows and prologue finally penned and their rough carriage so ridiculous should be presented at our tent to us. Ladies, withdraw the gallants are at hand. Whip to our tents as rows that run our land. Well, <clears throat> there, sir, God save you. Uh, where's the princess? And gone to her tent. Please it your majesty command me any service to her villa. That she vouchsafe me an audience for one word? I will, and so will she. I know, my lord. Ah, oh, this fellow pecks at wit as pigeons peas and utters it again when Jove does please. This gallant pins the wenches on his sleeve. Had he been called Adam, he'd have tempted Eve. Oh. Oh, he can carve too, and, and lisp or more sure than nice, that when he plays at tables, chides the dice in honourable terms. Oh, the ladies call him sweet. <laughs> the stairs, as he treads on them, kiss his feet. This is the flower that smiles on everyone, but shows his teeth as white as whale's bone, and consciousness that will not die in debt, pay him the due of honey-tongued boyette. Oh, a blister on his sweet tongue with my heart, that put Amado's page out of his part. Oh, see where it comes? Behaviour, what wert thou till this madman showed thee, and what art thou now? Oh, hail, sweet madam, and fair time of day! Uh, fair in all hail is foul, as I perceive. I, Conster my speeches better, if you may. 
Oh, then wish me better. I will give you leave. We came to visit you and purpose now to lead you to our court. Vouchsafe it then. This field shall hold me. Um, and so hold your vow. Nor God nor I delights in perjured men. Rebuke me not for that which you provoke. The virtue of your eye must break my oath. You nickname virtue. Vice you should have spoke, for virtue's office never breaks men's troth. Now, by my maiden honour, yet as pure as the unsullied lily, I protest. A world of torments, though I should endure, I would not yield to be your house guest. So much I hate breaking cause to be of heavenly oaths, vowed with integrity. Oh, you have lived in desolation here, unseen, unvisited, much to our shame. Oh, not so, my lord. It is not so, I swear. We have had pastimes here, and pleasant game. A mess of Russians left <coughs> out of late. How, how now, madam? Russians? Aye, in truth, my lord. Trim gallants, full of courtship and of state. Madam, speak true. It is not so, my lord. My lady, to the manner of the day, gives courtesy and undeserving praise. We four indeed confronted were with four in Russian habit. Here they stood an hour and talked apace. And in that hour, my lord, they did not bless us with one happy word. I dare not call them fools, but this, I think, when they are thirsty, fools would fain have drink. This jest is dry to me. G gentle sweet, your wits make wise things foolish. Uh, when we greet with eyes by seeing heaven's fiery eye, by light we lose light. Your capacity is of that nature that to your huge store wise things seem foolish, and rich things but poor. This proves you wise and rich, for in mine eye... I am a fool and full of poverty. But, they, but that you take what doth to you belong, it were a fault to snatch words from my tongue. Oh, I, I am yours, and all that I possess. All the fool? Mine? I cannot give you less. Which of the visors was it that you wore? Where? Uh, where? Uh, what visor? Uh, why demand you this? There, then, that visor, that superfluous <laughs> case that hid the worse and showed a better face. Oh, we were decried, they will mock us downright. Let us confess and turn it to a jest. Amazed, my lord. Why looks your highness sad? How cold his brows you swoon. Why look you so pale? Seasick, I think, coming from Moscovy. <laughs> oh, thus, pour down the stars, plagues for perjury. Can any face of brass hold out longer? Here stand I, lady. Dart thy skill at me, bruise me with scorn, confound me with flout, thrust thy sharp wit quite through my ignorance, cut me to pieces with thy keen conceit. And I will wish you never more to dance. No? nor never more in Russian habit waits. Oh, never will I trust to speech is penned, nor never come in visored to my friend. Taffeta phrases, silken terms precise, three piled hyperbole, spruce affection, figures pedantical, these summers fly have blown me full of maggot ostentation. I do forswear them. And here I protest, my wooing mind shall be expressed. And so, wench, so God help me law, my love to thee is sound. Sans crack or floor. Sansan, I pray you. Get under the trick of the old rage! Mm. <laughs> Bear with me. I am sick. I'll leave it by degrees. Uh, soft, let us see. Right, Lord, have mercy on us, on those three. They're infected. In their hearts it lies. They have the plague and caught it of your eyes. These lords have visited. You are not free. For the Lord's tokens on you do I see. No, they are free that gave us these tokens. Our states are forfeit, signal to undo us. 
uh, it is not so. For how can this be true that you stand forfeit being those that sue? Oh, peace, for I will not have to do with you. Nor shall not if I do as I intend. Speak for yourselves. My wit is at an end. Teach us, sweet madam, for our rude transgression. Some fair excuse. The fairest is confession. Were you not here, but even now disguised? Madam, I was. And were you well advised? I was, fair madam. When you then were here, what did you whisper in your lady's ear? That more than all the world, I did respect her. When she shall challenge this, you will reject her. Upon my honor, no. Please, peace, forbear. Your oath once broke. You force not to forswear. Despise me when I break this oath of mine. I will, and therefore keep it. Rosaline, what did the Russian whisper in your ear? Madam, he swore that he did hold me dear as precious eyesight and did value me above this world, adding thereto, moreover, that he would wed me or else die my lover. God give him joy of thee. The noble lord most honorably doth uphold his word. What mean you, madam? By my troth, I, I never swore to this lady such an oath. By heaven, you did, and to confirm it plain, you gave me this, uh, but take it, sir, again. Uh, my faith, and this, the, the princess did I give, I knew her by the jewel on her sleeve. Pardon me, sir, this jewel did she wear, and Lord Baron, I thank him is my dear. What? Will you have me? Or your pearl again? Oh. Uh. Neither of either. I remit both twain. Oh, I see the trick, and here was a consent, knowing aforehand of our merriment, to dash it like a Christmas comedy. Some carry tale, some please man, some slight zanny, some mumble news, some trencher knight, some dick that smiles his cheek in years and knows the trick to make my lady laugh when she's disposed, told of our intents before, which once disclosed the lady did change favours, and then we, following the signs, wooed but the sign of she. Now to add to our perjury, to add more terror, we are again forsworn in will and error. You put our page out. Go, you're allowed, down when you will. A smock shall be your shroud. You leer at me, do you? There's an eye, wounds like a leaden sword. All merrily hath this brave managed, this career been run. Lo, he is tilting strip piece. <laughs> I have done. Welcome, pure wit. <sighs> that part's the fair fray. Oh, Lord, sir, they would know whether the three worthies shall come in or no. What, are there but three? No, sir, but it is uh, very fine, for every one presents three. And three times three is five. Not so, under correction, sir. I hope it's not so. I hope, sir, that three times thrice is... Sir, is not is, nine. Um... How much is it? No, oh, Lord, sir, the parties themselves, the actors, sir, will show where until it doth amount. For mine own part, I am, as they say, but to perfect one man in one poor man. Pompeon the Great, sir. Ah, uh, thou one of the worthies. Why, <laughs> it pleased them to think me worthy of Pompey the Great. For mine own part, I know not the degree of the worthy, but... Um, I am to stand for him. Go, bid them prepare. We will turn it finally off, sir. We will, uh, we will take some care. Barone, they will shame us. Let them not approach. Uh, we are shame proof, my lord. And tis some policy to have one show worse than the king's and his company. I say they shall not come. Nay, good, my good lord, let me overrule you now. That sport best pleaseth, that doth least know how. Where zeal strives to content, and the contents dies in the zeal of that which it present, presents. 
Their form confounded makes most form in mirth, when great things labouring perish in their birth. A right description of our sports, my lord. Anointed! I am for so much expense of thy royal sweet breath, as will utter a brace of words. Doth this man serve God? Why ask you? A speaks not like a man of God at his making. <laughs> this is all one, uh, my fair, sweet, honey monarch. For I protest the schoolmaster is exceeding fantastical. Too, too vain. Too. Too vain! <laughs> but we will put it, as they say, to Fortuna de la Guerra. <laughs> I wish you the peace of mind, most royal Goupelamont. Uh, here is like to be a good presence of worthies. Uh, he presents Hector of Troy, the swain, uh, the great, the parish curate Alexander, Armado's page Hercules, uh, the pedant Judas Maccabeus, and if these four worthies in their first show thrive, these four will change habits and present the other five. If there is five in the first show. No, you are deceived. Uh, Tis not so. Uh, the pedant, the braggart, the hedge beast, the pool, and the boy. The ship is under sail. Here she comes amain. <laughs> Pompey, am. You lie, you're not he. I, Pompey, am. With leopard's head on knee. Oh, well said, old mocker. I must needs be friends with thee. I, Pompey, am. Pompey, surnamed the big. The great. Oh, yeah, he is great, sir. Pompey, surnamed the Great, that oft in field with Taj and shield did make my foe to sweat. <laughs> and travelling along this coast, I am here come by chance and lay my arms before this sweet lass of France. <laughs> if, if, if your ladyship would say thanks, Pompey, are uh, done. A great thanks, great Pompey. Tis not so much worth, uh, but I hope I was perfect. <laughs> I made a little fault in um, in great. I had to hate me. Pompey proves the best worthy. <laughs> <laughs> in the world I lived, I was the world's commander by east, west, north, south. I spread my conquering might. My Scotch and Plains declares that I am Alexander. Your nose says no, you are not, for it stands too right. Your nose smells no in this most tender smelling night. The conqueror is dismayed. Proceed, good Alexander. Um, when in the world I, I lived, uh, I was the world's commander. Oh, most true, tis right. You were so well as sodder. On the great. Uh, uh, your servant. Oh, and uh, and Costard. Take away the conqueror. Take away Alexander. Oh, sir, you have overthrown Alexander the conqueror. <laughs> you'll 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 be scraped out of the painted cloth for this. You, your lion that owns his pole axe sitting on a close stool be given to Ajax. He will be the ninth worthy. A <laughs> conqueror and a fear to speak. Oh, run away for shame, Alexander. <sighs> there. And it shall please you, a foolish mild man. An honest man, look you, and soon dash, but um, there are worthies coming will speak their mind in some other sort. Stand aside, good Pompey. Great Hercules is presented.
prevented by this imp whose club killed Cerberus, that three-headed Canis, when he was a babe, a child, a shrimp. Thus did he strangle serpents in his manus. Judas, I am... Judas! Not Iscariot, sir. Judas, I am. Eclipped, Maccabeus. Judas, Maccabeus clipped his plane. Judas! A kissing traitor. How art thou proved, Judas? Uh, Judas, I am. Um, what name for you, Judas? What you mean? What mean you, sir? To make Judas hang himself. Begin, sir. You are my elder. I will follow. Judas was hanged on an elder. <laughs> I will not be put out of countenance. Sir, has no face. What is this? A sitting head. The head of a bodkin. A death face in a ring. The face of an old Roman coin. Scarce seen. And now forward, for we have put thee in countenance. You have put me out of countenance. False, we have given thee faces. But you have outfaced them all. And thou wert a lion, we would do so. Therefore, as he is an ass, let him go. And so, O oh Jew, sweet Jude, uh, nay, why dost thou stay? The latter end of his name. For the ass to the Jude, give it him, Jude, ass away. This is not generous. This is not gentle. This is is not humble. A light for more sure, Judas. It grows dark. He may stumble. Alas, poor Maccabeus. How he hath been ah. baited. <laughs> Hide thy head, Achilles. Here comes Hector ooh, in arms. <laughs> when my mocks come home by me, I will now be merry. Uh, Hector was but a Trojan in respect of this. Where is this Hector? I think Hector was not so clean timbered. Yeah, this cannot be Hector. He's a god or a painter, for he makes faces. The army potent Nas of Lances, the Almighty, <laughs> gave Hector a gift. A gilt nutmeg. A lemon. Up with cloves. No cloven. In a piece, the army potent Mars of Lances, the Almighty, gave Hector a gift. The heir of Ilion, a man so free that certain he would fight. Yea! From morn till night, out of his pavilion, I am that flower. That mint! That columbine! Sweet Lord Longerville, rein thy tongue! Oh, I must rather give it the rein. It runs against Hector. I have Hector's a greyhound. The sweet warm man is dead and rotten, sweet Chucks. Beat not the bones of the buried. When he breathed, he was a man. But I will forward with my device. <clears throat> sweet royalty, bestow upon me the sense of hearing. Speak, brave Hector. We're much delighted. I do adore thy grace's sweet slipper. <laughs> Loves her by the foot. He may not by the yard. This Hector, far surmounted Hannibal. Oh, the, the party is gone. It's... Fellow Hector, she is gone. She is Two months on her way. What needst thou? Faith, unless she play the honest Trojan, the poor wench is cast away. She's quick. The child brags in her belly. Taste yours! Dost thou infernize me among potentates? Thou shalt die. <laughs> Then shall Hector be whipped for Jaconetta that is quit by him, and hanged for Pompey that is dead by him. Most rare Pompey. <laughs> Renowned Pompey. <laughs> Rater than great, 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 great Pompey, Pompey the huge. Hector <laughs> trembles. Pompey is moved, moved, it is moved. Stir them on, stir them on. Hector will <laughs> challenge him. Aye. Yeah. Blood in his belly, there will serve 
By the North Pole, I do challenge thee. I will not fight with a pole like a northern man. I'll slash. I'll do it by the sword. I, I, I betray me. Let me have my arms again. Room for the incensed worthies. I'll do it in my shirt. Most resolute Pompey. Master, let me take you a buttonhole lower. Do you not see Pompey is uncasing for the combat? What mean you? You'll lose your reputation. Gentlemen and soldiers, pardon me. I will not combat in my shirt. You may not deny it. Pompey hath made the challenge. Sweet bloods, I both may and will. Oh, what reason have you for it? Well, the naked truth of it is, I have no shirt. I go Woolworth for penance. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> God save you, madam. <laughs> God save you, madam. Oh, Mercury, uh, but that thou interrupts our uh, merriment. Uh, I am sorry, madam. The news I bring is heavy in my tongue. King, your father. Dead. For my life. Even so, so my tale is told. Worthies, away, this scene begins to cloud. For my own part, I breathe free breath. I have seen the day of wrong through the little hole of discretion, and I will right myself like a soldier. How fares your majesty? For yet, prepare. I, I will away tonight. Madam, not so. I do beseech you, stay. Prepare, I say. I thank you, gracious lords, for all your fair endeavours, and entreat out of a new sad soul that you vouchsafe in your rich wisdom to excuse or hide the liberal opposition of our spirits. If overboldly we have borne ourselves in the converse of your breath, your gentleness was guilty of it. Farewell, worthy lord. A heavy heart bears not a nimble tongue. Excuse me, so coming too short of thanks for my great suit so easily obtained. The extreme parts of time extremely forms all causes to the purpose of his speed. And, and often at his very loose decides that which long process could not arbitrate. And, and though the morning brow of progeny forbid the smiling courtesy of love, the holy suit which fain it would convince, yet since love's argument was first on foot, let not the cloud of sorrow jostle it from what it purposed, since to wail friends lost is not by much so wholesome profitable as to rejoice, friends, but newly found. I understand you not. My griefs are a double. Honest, plain words best pierce the ear of grief. Uh, and by these badges I understand the king. For your sakes, have we neglected time? Played foul play with our oaths? Your beauty, ladies, hath much deformed us, fashioning our humours even to the opposed ends of our intents. And what in us hath seemed ridiculous, hath misbecome our oaths and gravities, those heavenly eyes that look into these faults suggested us to make. Therefore, ladies, our love being yours, the error that love makes is likewise yours. Oh, we to ourselves prove false by being once false forever to be true to those that make us both. Now, ladies, you. And even that falsehood in itself a sin thus purifies itself and turns to grace. We have received your letters full of love, 
your favours, ambassadors of love, and in our maiden council rated them at, at courtship, pleasant jests, and courtesy as bombast and lining to the time. But more devout than this, in our respects have we not been, and therefore met your loves in their own fashion like a merriment. Our, our letters, madam, showed much more than jest. Books. We did not quote them so. Now, at the last minute of the hour, grant us your loves. A, a time, methinks, too short to make a world with an out-end bargain in. No. No, my lord. Your grace is perjured much, full of dear guiltiness, and therefore this. If for my love, as there is no such cause, you will do aught, this you shall do for me. Your oath I will not trust, but go with speed to some forlorn and naked hermitage, remote from all pleasures of the world. There stay until the twelve celestial signs have brought about the annual reckoning. If this austere, insociable life change not your offer made in the heat of blood, if frosts and fasts, hard lodging and thin weeds nip not the gaudy blossom of your love, but that it bear this trial and last love, then at the expiration of the year come challenge me. Challenge me by these deserts and by this, this virgin palm now kissing thine. I will be thine. Until that instant shut my woeful self up in a morning house, raining the tears of lamentation for the remembrance of my father's death. If thou do deny, let our hands part, neither entitled to the other's heart. If this or more than this, I would deny to flatter up those powers of mine with rest, the sudden band of death close up mine eye. Hence, hermit then, my heart is in thy breast. And what to me, my love? And what to me? You must be perjured too, your sins are wrecked. You're a taint with false and perjury. Therefore, if you my favor mean to get, a twelve month shall you spend and never rest, but seek the weary beds of people sick. But what to me, my love, what, what to me? A wife? A beard, fair health and honesty. With threefold love, I wish you all these three. Shall I say, I thank you, gentle wife. Not so, my lord. A twelve month and a day, I'll mark no words that smooth-faced wooers say. Come when the king doth to my lady come, then if I have much love, I'll give you some. I'll serve thee true and faithfully till then. Yet swear not, lest you be forsworn again. What say Maria? At the twelve months end, I'll change my black gown for a faithful friend. I'll stay with patience, but the time is long. The like are you. Few taller are so young. Studies, my lady. Mistress, look on me. Behold the window of my heart. Mine eye. What humble suit attends thy answer there? Impose some service on me for thy love. Oft have I heard of you, my Lord Barone, before I saw you. And the world's large tongue proclaims you for a man replete with mocks, full of comparisons and wounding flouts, which you on all estates will execute that lie within the mercy of your wit. To weed this warm foot from your fruitful brain, and therewithal to win me, if you please, without the which I am not to be won. You shall this 12 month term from day to day visit the speechless sick and still converse with groaning wretches and your task shall be with all the fierce endeavor of your wit to enforce the painted impotent to smile. To move wild laughter in the throat of death 
It can't be, it is impossible. Mirth cannot move a soul in agony. Why? That's the way to choke a jiving spirit whose influence is begot of that loose grace which shallow laughing ears give to fools. A jest's prosperity lies in the ear of him that hears it, never in the tongue of him that makes it. And if sickly ears, deft with the clamors of their own dear groans, will hear your idle scorns, continue then, and I will have you end that fault withal. But if they will not, throw away that spirit, and I shall find you empty of that fault, right joyful of your reformation. Twelve month. <sighs> well, before what will befall? I'll jest a twelve month in an hospital. Sweet Majesty, vouchsafe me. Was not that Hector? The worthy knight of Troy. <laughs> I will kiss thy royal finger and take leave. I am a votary. I have vowed to Jaconetta to hold the plough for her sweet love three years. <laughs> Aye, sweet my lord, and so I, I take my leave. No, madam, we will bring you on your way. Ah, uh, wooing doth not end like an old play. Jack hath not Jill. These ladies' courtesy might well have made our sport a comedy. Come, sir. It wants a twelve month and a day, and then twill end. That's too long for a play. Exeunt omnes. <laughs> When daisies pied and violets blue, lady smocks are silver white, and cuckoo buds of yellow hue do paint the meadows with delight. A cuckoo then on every tree mocks married men for the sea. Icicles hang by the wall, and did the shepherd blows his nail, and some best locks into the hole, and milk comes frozen home in pain. When blood is nipped and ways be found, and nightly sings a staring owl to it. A merry note While Gracie Joan doth steal the Give yourselves a big round of applause, everybody. Get back in here. That was absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much. Round of applause for everyone there. Oh, my word. What a play. What a play. And what a finish. Thank you so much for that uh, original arrangement there, Steve. That was absolutely stunning. Please do let me know uh, if you have any questions now for any of our uh, actors and indeed for Andrea as well, who I believe is still with us. So Andrea, if you'd like to join us for the post-show discussion, we'd love to have you. Hi there, there we are. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh my God, what an ending. What an ending. Phenomenal. Thank you so much, guys. Ah, brilliant. So uh, we're on about a 10 second delay. So our questions will start coming through anytime soon, usually after the absolute avalanche of applause emojis uh, have finished rolling in. Uh, and I can tell you they are rolling in big time right now. Uh, and also uh, I have to say there were many, many applause emojis throughout the scenes. And for the first time, people were throwing roses at the stage during scenes. So congratulations, guys. Give yourself backpats all around for that. That is absolutely amazing. Um, 
Just seen someone there say uh, best ending to Love's Labour's Lost I've ever seen. So we'll consider that mission accomplished. <laughs> It was a kind of a concept, really, because obviously we've lost Love's Labour's One, uh, which suggests that there might have been a sequel where these guys might come together. But it occurred to me that when uh, the play uh, kind of winds up with these two songs that are spring and winter, that is all about the passage of time and the passage, indeed, of a year. And so it seemed to me apparent, I guess, uh, that that was what it was covering and that, uh, and that we were actually seeing the kind of penance, as we've been calling it internally, uh, going on. So do please let us know uh, if you have any questions for our uh, actors, for our crew, uh, and for uh, our wonderful guest speaker, Andrea, as well. Oh, and there we go. We've got more roses flooding in now that I've mentioned them as well, so I should probably stop doing that. Stop encouraging them. Stop encouraging them. No, please, keep them coming. Keep them coming. Uh, no, it's wonderful. So please like and subscribe as well, please, before you leave. Uh, and do consider making a donation to the Patreon if you enjoyed tonight's show. And with that, hopefully we might start to get some questions trickling in. Uh, Sarah, have you yes. got anything coming through? Uh, yes, so we did actually have one, you just touched upon it, but someone asked what um, everyone thought personally about the ending. So I thought it'd be nice to uh, open that up to our cast and to Andrea as well. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> Well, I'll go first then. I, I love the ending, actually. I really do. I think um, it, it just, uh, it's funny enough, some of the people were commenting on YouTube and saying it's what makes the play because you have all this silliness and it is wonderfully silly. I love all the silly. But that's so touching. The ending is so touching. And this idea that they are going to prove themselves over the next year. I love it myself. I know it's, un by modern standards, it's unconventional. And when they did the Branagh film, of course, they changed it. They made it a happy ending. So, because <laughs> you can't have okay. a sad ending in a Hollywood film, uh, but um, but I love it. Yes, so, someone in the chat mentioned that, yeah, it's, it's the same. They, they are promising to, to be without the woman, but at the, at the beginning of the play, it's all because for fun or without, without any meaning. And at the end of the play, they, they decide to be a year hermit, but with, with actual meaning and, you know, with, so it's, it's the, same, the same action before and after and how, how, how does it change? So yeah, there was some comments on, on, the, on the chat about that different weight of the same action. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fabulous. I think it's also plays into Shakespeare's kind of big grand theory of time as well. Uh, his, his kind of two ideas about time were that you could only overcome it in, in one of two ways, fame or procreation. Uh, and fame was seen as the kind of folly one to go for uh, and procreation the kind of wiser one to go for. And the sonnets refer to this uh, frequently and uh, a number of the other works make reference to it. Uh, and I think it's really interesting that obviously the first two words are let fame in this and they start doing this oath for fame and then they finish doing this oath for love and I think it is a wonderful uh, transformation that they undergo in order to get there yeah I think it's fabulous Sarah any more questions yes, yes. Uh, so um I have oh uh oh sorry yes I was just checking the question so um the question is what was the most fun scene for you to play and that is to princess uh, Maria Catherine and Rosaline so for our lovely ladies. Ladies. <laughs> I think the Russian scene was super fun. Yeah, absolutely. Hilarious. Yeah, I mean, that was just one long scene. Yeah. It, yeah. Like, it was great. Like half the play, as Rob puts it. <laughs> Yeah, someone in the chat actually dropped some trivia on us. They said this was uh, this is the uh, the play that features the longest scene, the longest single word, and the longest speech in all of Shakespeare's plays. Which uh, I can absolutely believe. I have to assume that it's the Barone speech that takes the tip of the hat for the longest speech. And then uh, John, would you mind just giving us the longest word? Sorry, I didn't learn it and I've closed the script down. So <laughs> <laughs> Right answer, my friend. Right answer. Never again. One and done. One and done. Proof it to reading. I, I'm just, just glad to have got it. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it on the night, mate. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. Wonderful. Uh, Sarah, do we have okay. any more questions? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, just very quickly, someone has asked, is it rewatchable? Um, so, yes, uh, this very same link that you're on, um, uh, shortly after we finish the, the questions this evening, um, the link will then be available with the full show for you to rewatch back at any time. So please do share it with people, uh, come back to it anytime you like. 
so I have a question here for Emily. Um, so how did you approach reacting to the different scenes as a character who spent most of the scenes watching? I was gonna ask which Emily. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting because um, it's very different to being on stage and watching and giving focus when you know that somebody can just choose to watch you reacting. So you've just got to make sure that your inner life is intact so that whatever you're thinking is what your character's thinking because my face just does whatever's, I've got one of those faces that will just say whatever's going on in my head. So I've got to make sure that I'm staying with what's happening in character so that all those reactions are just honest as they, as they come through. Absolutely, absolutely. And it really worked a treat, mate, because it was fabulous to watch. Fabulous to watch, a great performance, great performance. Uh, got a question for Samia here. Uh, did you find it hard to act out such a different style? Uh, different style to what? I don't, I don't uh, know. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> someone's maybe seen you in like a new writing piece or something, maybe. Okay. Um, I think actually, well, I have done Shakespeare uh, once before. I played, I played Beatrice, which she's actually very similar to Rosaline. Uh, Rosaline is the proto Beatrice. So, um, I think what I like about Rosaline, the way I see her, she's younger, so there's a bit more ingenuity in a sense, um, um, the way I played her anyway. And no, I actually really enjoyed it. I really, really loved it so much. So I don't know how to answer that question. I don't know if you've noticed there we go. But thank you for the Wonderful. question. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, Cool, so we have uh, so a question here, which is, what are the biggest challenges for you guys in performing through Zoom? So that's kind of really for anyone. <laughs> I'm always fascinated by the answer to this as well, because every yeah. week we have new actors coming to this, potentially for the first time, and having to kind of go on this astronomical learning curve just with the tech, and then give these amazing performances on top of it. So I think it's, it's mind blowing. So yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your answers to this, guys. I could go first, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, on, at the beginning of when I come in with my with my letter, the wireless mouse fell off and <laughs> and it clicked out the audio. I'm like, <laughs> and then I moved a little and it clicked out the video too. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I was shirtless for you guys. <laughs> but then I came back on as a ghost and it was fine. So, so what we'll do is for our Patreon followers, we'll re-record the shirtless scene. So if you donate to Patreon, you get to see that special edition. Is this Patreon or OnlyFans? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is a perfect moment like that where we have our valiant swings. So thank you, Cameron. Exactly. Cameron, yes, well done, Cameron. Yes, you're the best, man. Thank that was so, so funny. It was so great because what we got was like this combination of the dubbing that we'd done in other scenes then yeah. happening while you were still on stage. Oh. Then you went off stage and then we heard your voice and saw Cameron's face. It was like a Russian doll. I think I saw uh, a couple of audience members saying like, did I take something before this scene started? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm blessed with Cameron's voice now. So I'll look <laughs> back at that and see what yeah, it looks I mean, like. That's thank you all for being so patient. It went pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> I, I had a similar issue for me because um, at the beginning of it, I didn't um, switch off my camera. So my camera was left on uh, a little bit too long. And uh, similar to PJ, I was actually thinking perhaps I ought to bring in the the large screen computer. It had enabled me to be able to read the script far more easily and so on without having to switch and so on and so forth. But then I thought if I'm controlling a mouse and a keyboard just trying to ensure where I am. No, I thought that spelt disaster. But uh, thankfully, Emily uh, uh, jumped in and uh, saved me from sheer disaster and, <laughs> and um, hell breaking loose and all such words. Yes, we've got to uh, we've got to give massive shout outs to Emily Ingram, who is constantly on top of it uh, in in the stage management department. Really extraordinary work, really extraordinary work. I've got a question now. Uh, I think, Andrea, it'd be great to get your take on this, just because I'm interested. Uh, how do you feel about Barone's beautiful speech before the interval? And do you feel this is Shakespeare telling us directly how he feels about uh, the inspiration of the women in his life? Oh, crumbs, that's a, that's a big question, big isn't question. it? <laughs> big question. Coming to you next, Ben, so get thinking. <laughs> um, 
So what was it again? So how's, is it about the woman? Ba- basically, who what, what do you think of the speech? And I do love you it. feel that it's Shakespeare talking about the women in his life or how he sees them? I love it. I loved Ben's delivery of it. I thought it was absolutely magical. Very, 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 very lovely. Um, and oh, I'm very reluctant to draw, oh, this must be about Shakespeare doing this. I mean, some academics like to kind of speculate on his life, but that's not something I feel particularly comfortable about. I don't think it's all that helpful. I just like the texts. And um, I think it's a gorgeous speech. And I think it's a it's a really interesting one because it's that, okay, I've got to solve the problem because we've done something really naughty here and I've got yeah. to solve it. But actually he solves it in a very beautiful way. So yeah, lovely speech. Fun bit of trivia. Uh, at our wedding, we actually had uh, a kind of cut down version of the Barone speech as the prologue to our wedding. Uh, because I personally find it one of the most beautiful pieces of writing that Shakespeare ever uh, put pen to paper on. I think it's absolutely stunning. Ben, how was it for you in the playing? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's such an amazing speech. Um, I think first, like coming to your the, one of the questions from before about like one of the issues, yeah, you know, what are the the issues that you have to kind of overcome performing on Zoom? It's it's I I think what I found hardest about sometimes being on the Zoom thing is about the interaction and about that kind of like bouncing back and forward. And I think like we work really hard and like your eyes are flitting all over the place because you're trying to take in what everyone's giving you and also keeping your eye on the script and also thinking about the camera and your costumes and the lights and everything else. And what's quite nice actually when you get to like a chunk of text is you can let a little bit of that go and you can just kind of lose yourself a little bit more in the kind of in just working your way through the journey of that speech. And it, it's it's almost a little bit easier, I found on Zoom. Um, in terms of the speech, like, I mean, it's just an absolutely beautiful, beautiful speech. And I think like, I, I don't know in terms of, you know, with Shakespeare, I've, I've got no knowledge. I shall leave it to our more academic experts on uh, <laughs> whether he was writing about his own kind of life with it. But, you know, I think he's certainly pulling stuff, isn't he, into there. And it's, it's just so gorgeously written. And I think what we really tried to do in rehearsals is, try and sort of break it apart and like find the journey of all the different things. And we, we made the comparisons to the Henry V, we happy few speech and the sort of the discoveries that he makes in the moment. And that sort of idea, Rob, that, that you brought up that that this is the moment that Barone's superpower is actually useful for the first time. His superpower of, of his words and his language and his ability to spin and twist until they get the, the answer that they want from it. But yeah, it's incredible to perform. Absolutely. I think it's interesting that the idea that um, the stakes have to be uh, really high for the for the achievement to be extraordinary. And I think that's where the massive book at the start really sets out the fact that, you know, the horrific tortures that are involved in uh, the kind of punishments for all these things. You know, it, it does take an extraordinary feat in order to overturn that piece of legislation and the fact that he manages to do it in one speech. I personally think this is probably the inspiration for many, many courtroom dramas. You know, it really feels like uh, the way everything turns on a dime in, in a lot of kind of Aaron Sorkin work as well. It's always usually one big speech that changes the tide. Uh, and I think this is one of the best examples of that in Shakespeare. Um, Sarah, any more questions? Uh, yes, we have a very important one that we must address. Yeah, OK. The ducks. Yes. We must hear the duck story. We must hear the duck story. <laughs> Over the to you, Charlotte. waiting with bated breath. <laughs> So oh, um, yeah, the ducklings. Uh, we're just looking after for a little, a little while. Um, we live on a boat on the river Avon. Um, so, so basically, I just got cast in this, and that was like, yay, something to do for the week. And um, the next day, heard this peeping, and uh, we went, we both went out because we've had ducklings around, and we've been putting them back with their family and chasing them around for the last month and uh, we saw a family that we've been watching they were a family of five they had two extras and we were like huh they've adopted some except two of them were really little and the mother was drowning them it's really it's, 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 it's like Shakespeare um, the, the mother was like drowning these ducklings so I genuinely started like barking like a dog quacking like a duck um like trying to get the babies to me and the mother away and um yeah my partner and another person at the marina helped we fished them out and then we had this problem because all the others we'd either taken to the sanctuary or put back with their families and we were like these guys we don't know their families so we've been in touch with um 
someone who rescues ducks and uh, they're like helping us and we're hoping that they're just going to go back into the wild soon but um then I felt really guilty because I turned up to rehearsal with no sleep and um because they they were cold so they were in bed all night but like I was like um didn't want to squash them <laughs> <laughs> So until we got the heat lamp, we were like, hot water bottle, put them next to us. Um, and then, yeah, so that's a long story. But yeah, that's where they are. And and hopefully they will be back in the wild in a few weeks. That was an amazing story, though. I'm hearing this for the first time as well. So I'm glad the audience asked, because that is a, an incredible feat. Yeah. I've got a question here for Gar Kay. How was it for you uh, as, a, as a non-actor? Oh, interesting question. Um, well, I come from this... Um, as a as someone who studied Shakespeare and taught the plays, but I'm not I'm not a professional actor, so I, I tend to defer to um, like Rob when he's giving me notes and things like that. Um, I, I'm just very lucky to be here, to be honest. That's all I can say. I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity and for the experience. Well, you did a great job, mate, and the audience really enjoyed your performance. So thank you so much for taking part. We really, really appreciate it. It was a great job. Great job, Sarah. Any more? Yes. Uh, so, um, I've got here Longueville, King, Dumain and Barone. What do you think, apart from the calendar stuff, the men actually get up to during that year? Uh, and the, there was a statement at the end saying, I doubt they only did what the ladies told them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a well, good question. Know what? <laughs> Maria didn't tell Longueville anything. <laughs> so, you know, true, yeah. he could have done anything he wanted, but, but, but. But he wanted to get his lady's love, so he did some manual labor and <laughs> um, crossed out the days, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> yeah, for Dumaine, he literally was praying to the, the beard gods, um, because if it was me, he'd, he'd be screwed. <laughs> I Yeah, so he's praying to the, the, to the beard gods, definitely. Um, and we were talking a lot about Dumaine's character. He's always we made a sort of joke that he, maybe he was... Um, he'd volunteered to work at Samaritans or something or because he's always quite good natured and always quite up for it not up for a laugh but always quite yeah very nice person very positive person so I think but charity work why not and I think he'd be very faithful to Catherine I think so <laughs> I, think, I that, think so yeah go on, go on Adam I, I was gonna say I think that part of it is was probably some of what the king was setting out to do in the beginning that if we if we take some time that what they lamented is now they elected to do uh, without having to sign their lives away and said, maybe I'll spend some time becoming a better, more thoughtful person. And by doing that, I'll be a better lover, a better husband, and a, just a better human being. Yeah. And I think they're probably all too worried as well that people are going to be watching them from trees to <laughs> too far off the beaten path. Yep. No worries. <laughs> Stephen, do you need a new lamp? Uh, no, uh, well, maybe. I mean, that lamp's been pretty bust for uh, quite a while. Um, it's not It's not too scratched, I don't think. I think hitting the lampshade was probably a bad decision. <laughs> it seems like every time... Um, this is the second one of these I've done now, so I, I sort of tend to break something every time I do it, so I think it's a good luck charm. <laughs> Me means you're co fully committed, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Also, got one here for you, Alice. Quickly, can we get a full version of Pony? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I did end up learning all of it in French, and um, so yeah, whenever you want, I will record a full Magic Mike style one with water drop for the Patron or OnlyFans. Amazing, yes, let's do that. So, that is a Patreon exclusive. We'll have a full version of Pony. Steve, can we get a full version of the of the uh, fi final song as well? Yeah, no problems. Amazing. Amazing, and a full version of that absolutely stunning final song. Mm. Uh, Steve, I don't know whether it's someone, just magic. Someone was mentioning but... as well a, a Patreon a calendar, full calendar for, for the, 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 the all... In boys' calendar. Yes, <laughs> we, can, we can put the boys' calendar on there for sure, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, great <laughs> idea, great yeah. idea. Uh, um, yeah, sorry, go on, Sarah. Just to say, um, uh, someone asked actually on the final song, um, but uh, like, how did it work? Was it freestyled? Um, but Stephen, you you wrote it. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, 
I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know really. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, the, 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 Come on. the, 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 the lyrics are, are what's written in the script. And Rob just said he needed something. So I, I, I've i literally got nothing to do. Like, like it was so, uh, and uh, so just, just sitting playing about. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's such a nice poetic song. And uh, it's sometimes, and like, I don't know, I've been doing a lot of singing over the last couple of years, which has been really cool. And uh, I think my mind is a little bit still in the singing zone a little bit. So, and as I said a couple of weeks ago to Rob, I've been, tr- I want to get back to doing this, which is what I uh, started my career doing. Like, and I've been fortunate enough to do more like musicals recently, but I'm sort of, my head's still in that zone a bit. So I think maybe as someone who isn't really a songwriter, I think just picking something up and just playing about with stuff that I like in my head and little melodies is just is just fun. So the whole thing about it is being fun. If it was a hard thing to do, it it, it wouldn't have been done probably. So yeah. yeah. Fab. And it's Absolutely. yeah, we just love it so much. We love it, we love it. it. And I think it, it's it's one of those important things where we kind of we do Marie, Marie Kondo these shows a lot. You know, it is it is my kind of brief at the start of the thing is follow your joy, you know, like find find the thing that makes you happiest and throw yourself at it. Uh, and build it up and you know the result of that I hope is that you guys are feeling that on the other side as well and that you can see that not only are you having a good time but the the actors are having a good time doing it for you at the same time that was a lot of mentions of the word time next question (laughs) yes Um, (laughs) so I have one here which um is do you think this kind of uh way of doing theatre um can work in the future um after lockdown or is it only meant to be an emergency uh sort of way of performing for this time we know what our answer is on that <laughs> so uh I'll, i'd be I'll, interested to hear other perspectives yeah yeah <laughs> exactly yeah i'll throw it out to the to the rest of the gang i sort of hope so and at the same time i just hope it's an extension a, a brilliant extension a way of getting things like this out to more people uh in a, in a more affordable manner but i don't think it will ever replace the the brilliance of live theater but what i would say is when you have someone who is a uh, a team of people working on this not i'm talking about obviously everyone here but the especially like rob and sarah and emily uh yara and Enrique, they have such a good eye and a good knowledge and feel for live theater and how it should be they're very good at finding people who also can perform in that manner and I think this separates that a little bit um, I think sometimes when you watch like uh, National Theatre Live or you watch uh, like the RSC Live things like that I think sometimes they suffer from just being almost like an archive recording and uh, things like this is, is meant for this so I think you have to balance my personal opinion is you have to balance it out um, but that's just me. And I don't think it will ever replace it. And all these things are very good. And you should be able to watch as much theatre as possible. But I think it's just, I think it's the, that feeling when you're in the room. And especially, where, I mean, we're, we've never been in the same room. And I'm sure if we had all been in the same room, so, like there'd be so much more chemistry like that would have times it by a hundred. Because it's so brilliant that you can create chemistry in this weird kind of fake way, but it's not, if you get what I'm saying. But um, I'm sorry, I'm babbling. <laughs> I think so just off the back, off the, oh, go on, go on, Alex, go on. I was going to say, like, just what you were saying, Stephen, I think it's it's a really interesting, because um, I, I don't think we're from a place like this, because there's so many times in this when I'm like, oh, we could have gone so far with this or, you know, made use of a live audience. But also there's there's things that we did in this that we couldn't do. Um, if we, if we went on Zoom. I think it's a really interesting idea to sort of just say we did do one day in the future, like a, a full scale theatre performance of Love's Labour's Lost. Um, it would be interesting to have it as like an addition to live theatre. So just say you're doing much ado about nothing um, in a big city centre um, and you're conscious that there's people who live really far away or, or they can't afford to get in to see a lot of theatre. It's interesting to, then you could do like a Zoom version of our show. You, you could all say commit and be like, Hey, so while we're doing the live theatre version, let's come in during the daytime and do a Zoom version that we can stream to people who can't get to our theatre. That might be an an interesting way to go on from this, potentially. That sort of accessibility, Alice, is kind of why I personally hope that this becomes a thing. I mean, yeah, obviously it will never replace 
live theatre, it's a whole different medium. But this is so accessible. This is so accessible for people to be able to watch it. It's so accessible for people to be able to take part in it. I mean, I honestly, I don't know, and frankly, in the best possible way, I don't care whether any member of the cast is in any way disabled because th there is no reason for it to affect anything. And that makes this one of, in my ways, the, 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 one of the best mediums. Because mm. so many times you think that person would be absolutely brilliant, why haven't they been cast? And it's because of something that means they can't perform on a stage as easily or as readily. This is brilliant. This means so many more people can be a part of this, and it's it's glorious. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I'm I I consider myself to be a perfect and prime example of that because uh, I, for one, over the last you know twelve eighteen months or however long, I've only ever focused on theatrical performances and so on on a weekend because usually Monday to Friday, nine to five, I can't really commit because sometimes I don't know what might be as an hearing or something. So I have a tendency to try and manage my time and balance it. So I would do more on-screen uh, type of roles as opposed to theatre. Uh, this opportunity came up and it was absolutely perfect for me. So 100% everything when you say accessibility wise, and of course, it's not just accessibility of the actors, but actually those people who traditionally won't be seeing theatre will now be able to see it by virtue of this medium. So not hats off, but, you know, wigs off. <laughs> <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. Alex, did you have something that you wanted to add just before we move on? I'm li yeah, I'm only going to say, just to add on to Stephen's point, how in innovative the whole process has been and how sort of it's meant, yeah, when... So you sort of you're signing up and starting out doing this. So our first rehearsal, which was only on Sunday, which I still can't believe we managed to pull this off in two and a half days. Mental, but um, yeah, mental. Um, just how innovative it can be in this in this way, and just how how funny and how brilliant everyone's performances can be in this in this way. I I don't for me personally feel like it, it can ever replicate live theatre, although we did come close tonight <laughs> with some live theatre, but. Um, yeah, I just think it, it, it is an amazing, innovative way of, like everyone's saying, making it accessible and, yeah. I think for me, it's it's not, it's never gonna be, and it's never intended to be a replacement for theatre. I think that the idea that you could ever replace something that's existed for what, 6,000 years, uh, it's unlikely, you know, it's, it's part of the fabric of who we are as human beings, theatre, uh, and that live shared experience. And I know I'm, I'm desperate for it, and I'm sure all of you are as well. Uh, what I think it, it absolutely does, however, is bring a liveness of shared experience still, which in this circumstance, you, you can't get through any other medium. Uh, and I think what I've seen from seeing the audience's reactions and what I've seen from seeing you guys together in the live, in the chat in here, in the kind of like virtual green room as it were, and all that kind of thing, it gives you the same thrill of live performance, uh, even if it's not uh, live theater per se. Uh, and I think that no, that is- Maybe worse, just cause it's just like, it's you can't you, see them smiling back. <laughs> you in a screen. It's you in a screen, and you can't. You're not there. You can, there's no that sort of camaraderie that you get backstage with actors. Yeah. And sort of like, come on, let's go and let's go and do this. And you can't pat each other back and give each other a hug or anything like that. But it, so it's, in a way, it's, you're there by yourself. But obviously, you're not. But it's, yeah. It's yeah. Really I think it's an interesting point. That Sorry. Could go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's interesting what Ben said as well, though, because Ben said uh, about how do, when doing a more emotional speech or a more kind of uh, introspective speech, I, I guess, or one way you're trying to search through the thoughts, that actually this can sort of be a benefit because it's something that we've noticed week after week is that actors, when they're in their own safe space on their own without being stared at, they can actually commit more fully to being more open and vulnerable and things like that than maybe, or certainly would it would take a lot more energy. It'd be a lot more difficult to get to that same place uh, when you are uh, doing it in front of a thousand people, you know? So um, there are advantages in that way as well, I think, because it, it does become like a private conversation with, with the lens. Uh, and because the lens doesn't judge you, you can feel a lot freer through that, I think. I, uh, sorry, I, Garke, sorry, I cut yeah, you off. I, don't mind. Sorry. Uh, I feel that um, Rob really pushed us to, as, an, as a cast to really kind of exploit the medium as much as possible. So there's, there's one gag right at the start of the play where um, Alex has the copy of Twilight and then he passes it across it through the screen and it becomes the RSC complete work. So it's, it's just genius, absolutely mm -hmm. genius. 
Um, and I think the other thing I would say is that um, this cast is much more international than you would traditionally get in a uh, in a theatre. So we have you know people from the states, you know, both sides of the states. I think uh, uh, up and down the UK, people like myself who normally wouldn't be able to commit to live theatre. So I, I think yeah, um, uh, uh, as everyone else says, I don't think it's going to ever replace you know the magic of you know the room, as it were, the darkened room. But it it, it certainly I think I think people will start to be looking at this medium more and more as a way of getting theatre out to people. Absolutely, and I think hopefully this this serves as a trailer of sorts um, for uh, for the real experience. But yeah, sorry, Nadia. Uh, yeah, I was just going to build off everyone what you're all saying, but like it's like the spark before you get in the room, which I love. Like I I love meeting new people, and I think exactly what you know Stephen said. I'm quite a tactile person. So when I'm performing, I love to get like physical <laughs> and such, do you know what I mean? And like this movement and all that kind of thing. So I think performing to the screen is, is, is obviously that barrier. However, this is a way of like working towards something to go onto stage as well. So like you can even elongate the rehearsal period for, for a play that could be mammoth, that needs a lot of work and like, you know, funding or whatever. I think it's such an amazing, I think you can utilize it really well. And yeah, absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to just reflect back to you some of the comments from our audience who have said it's a great way to do gr geographically diverse shows. Uh, show Must Go Online has enabled me to experience Shakespeare that I would uh, have difficulty accessing normally. Thank you so much. Uh, also brilliant that we're getting all of the plays because uh, as uh, Andrea pointed out, this one is relatively rarely performed uh, compared to the other ones. Um, and uh, someone's also said, uh, I think we've got another one here. Um, first time in my life I've met so many other people who love Shakespeare too. So it's actually kind of created a community uh, that, uh, and I've found that just through doing this is that I've met so many people that I've never met before as a consequence of doing the show uh, that all share this same passion. And the fact that that's happening for the audience as well, I think is brilliant. Uh, probably time for one more question, Sarah, and then we'll wrap it up. Sure, sure. Okay. Ooh, which one am I gonna pick? Yeah. Um, Oh, so we, um, okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll throw this one out and see what you want to share. Uh, how did you pull off the Invisible Man scene? Enrique? Enrique? Tell him. <laughs> you better tell him, man, because uh, it's a lot, and I just figured it all out, I like, guess, yesterday. I guess I have to be a, a patron. No, I, I don't know, it's, uh, well, Rob, uh, we had uh, on, was it on Thursday, Friday? Can remember? Friday, I think. Yeah. Friday, we had a an, like a research, research and development session on all the creative teams. So Rob, Sarah, uh, Emily, Garrett, and myself, we got together and we went through the play and you know, been brainstorming ideas and we were just trying to find ways of uh, using the virtual background that Zoom has an ability. Uh, oh, I thought you're magical. <laughs> yeah, no. I I am. <laughs> I am. I just I, need I a little push. You don't see me because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I know you sometimes you sometimes ignore me, but I'm what? still here. Exactly. What? Yeah. What yeah PJ is a predator. Is the answer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and by that I mean the alien. I mean the alien uh, that is called a predator from the 1980s movie. Let me make the, that very right. clear. So this is so a what very, happened? I'm glad we cleared that up. Yeah, so what happened, I had to set all the lights exactly as it would be and the chair as it would be. I took a picture of this all, but I had to do it like with the mount like, away. And then I turn on the wireless background. Um, the thing is, the thing is, there's a way to make it so that it's around you. And then you press a button and then suddenly anything that's this color would be would disappear. So um, amazing, Enrique and Rob for um, pulling that up. I'm like, I have to do this. And sadly, sadly, <laughs> it necessitated you having to take your shirt off in order to go uh, invisible. So, you know, uh, real, real, real no, tough. No, that happens in real life too. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Love it. Love it so much. Uh, and sorry, Maria, I'm very sorry. Uh, I think you were trying to jump in a couple of times and I think we cut across you. So apologies for that. Um, 
That's okay. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I was, I was going to build upon the whole um, accessibility thing. Um, it's, it's great because I have family, it's on a very personal note, I have family all over the world. Um, my sister tuning in from Singapore, it's like 4am, I think now. Um, hey, <laughs> and then uh, two sisters um, in the States, my dad's over in Singapore, my mom's in Holland, um, everyone's all over the place. And it's just like my family can actually be there and watch this. And that's just so, and you know, not, they, they haven't been able to fly to London to see me in anything or, you know, it's just hard when um, everyone's sort of like all over the place. So um, I love, this is just such a great medium for, for everyone and anyone that has family or friends, even ex-colleagues that are elsewhere all over the world. And they can share the joy of Shakespeare with you. They'll be here afterwards, right? So, yeah. yeah, 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 and it'll be, be here, here forever. forever. So yeah, whenever exactly. whenever you want to watch it, it will be there for you. <laughs> whenever you need a laugh, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> wonderful. So that's all we've got time for tonight. We're approaching half past ten, so we're going to call it there. But thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Please join us again on Monday. Go to the uh, YouTube description to find a link to the event right where you can get a ticket for much ado about Mean Girls. We're going to be doing a selection of scenes from Mean Girls. Can't wait for that, and I can assure you the cast for this has just come in and they are absolutely brilliant. And then join us next Wednesday, please, if you will, uh, for Richard the Second, please. That's Richard the Second this time, same place, same time, uh, Wednesday, 7 p.m. BST, 2 p.m. EDT for Richard the Second. So thank you so much, everybody, and good night. Be there or be square. <laughs>